Bonjour à tous. Donc nous allons commencer la. la... Yes, it, it, it will be in French. Sorry. Next time it will be in English, but as far as we have uh, very good interpreters. Давайте, давайте по русски. Все по русски. Давайте без проблем. Давайте. Все. Donc, euh, nous allons ouvrir et démarrer cette dernière session de ces deux jours de, de, de conférences euh, intenses où euh, il y a eu euh, euh, des débats, des discussions, des désaccords. Et, euh, et je pense que c'est très important qu'il que, que, que y ait cela dans l'université. Euh, cela montre qu'il y a euh, une, une, une vie démocratique euh, dans l'université. Euh, qui est un lieu, un espace de, de liberté, euh, qu'il euh, qu est important de préserver euh, et de s'écouter. Euh, et je suis à peu près certain que cette liberté de ton euh, aura également lieu durant cette dernière session avec trois intervenants euh, qui, dont les interventions, euh, tournent autour de, de, de l'unilatéralisme. Je, je, je ne sais pas ce que va dire Miloche, mais peut-être qu'il en parlera. Euh, mais dans tous les cas, à la, à la lecture des, des intitulés, euh, le professeur euh, Blanco Rakic, qui va nous parler de, de la question de la promesse, euh, alors, vaste question, en droit international, d'un acte unilatéral, euh, la question de l'auteur de la promesse, euh, le destinataire de la promesse, le contenu de la promesse, euh, la, la forme de la promesse, publique, privée, orale, écrite. Euh, ces questions-là euh, ont des conséquences importantes en droit international, et je suis sûr que, que, que le professeur Rakic nous, nous, nous en parlera. Euh, puis ensuite euh, interviendra le professeur Tanasie Marinkovic, qui nous parlera aussi, d'une certaine manière, d'actes unilatéraux, en abordant la question de la sécession unilatérale, avec les deux cas qui nous ont déjà préoccupés aujourd'hui, la question de cas sensibles hein, du Kosovo et la question de, de la Crimée. Là encore, une question d'actes unilatéral, de choix unilatéral, de droit unilatéral, bref. Tout cela sera évidemment envisagé. Puis enfin, nous terminerons avec le professeur Miloš Jovanovic, qui, qui abordera une question générale qui fait écho avec, je crois, dans un, dans, sur un, un point de vue différent, mais tout de même qui fait écho avec la, la conférence inaugurale du professeur Miodrag Jovanovic, avec une question plus générale et qui permettra de, 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 de terminer euh, cette, euh, cette, euh, très belle, ce très beau colloque international euh, organisé d'une main de maître par euh, les collègues bordelais, mais surtout, euh, surtout par, par, par Tanassier. Et merci encore pour, pour tout cela. Et, euh, et voilà, j'en je, je, ai terminé. Je, je cède immédiatement la, la parole euh, au professeur euh, Branko Rakic, euh, qui nous parlera de la promesse, en nous faisant, j'espère, la promesse de tenir... 15-20 minutes. Voilà. 15-20 minutes. À nos collègues. Tout d'abord, je voudrais, je voudrais présenter mes excuses aux collègues français de Bordeaux et de l'ambassade de France que je vois ici. Bon, malgré le fait que je me sens un peu plus à l'aise si je parle français et euh, malgré le fait que j'ai l'intention de défendre la cause d'Emmanuel Macron ici, bon, euh, euh, mon intervention euh, aujourd'hui sera en anglais. Donc, je vais continuer en anglais. Euh, euh, surtout parce que j'ai beaucoup de citations à faire et bon c'est à cause de ça et de, euh, presque tout, euh, pas presque toutes les citations sont, euh, sont en anglais même celle de Macron bon I continue in English okay <laughs> well I will speak about uh, the, the the legal value of unilateral declaration uh, but also I will speak about a specific unilateral declaration which is uh, uh, related to the topic of this of, of, of this conference and this is uh, the unilateral declaration Emmanuel Macron spoke about uh, or a, a promise uh, that was given uh, in 1990 by uh, uh, 
NATO leaders and by members of the by the leaders of uh, NATO states to the the, the, the Russian con concerning the expansion of uh, NATO towards east. So as you see here in uh, uh, Saint Petersburg, Petersburg uh, International Economic Forum, uh, Emmanuel Macron stated that uh, I think that the mistake uh, that was made in the last 20 years was that we in, in NATO failed to fully comply with all the obligations we had taken on. And this caused certain fears, quite reasonable ones. And we did not have the trust that Rus uh, Russia rightfully expected. So this uh, statement opens uh, practically two questions. One is uh, 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 whether there are any obligations that were taken on. And the second is, whether uh, uh, that obligation, it is the, the expansion of NATO, was uh, a bad uh, decision, a dangerous decision, or something that uh, uh, caused uh, justified fears uh, on the Russian side. Uh, uh, I won't focus on the second issue because it's uh, large geopolitical issues and it would require a whole conference uh, to speak about it. I just uh, can say that. Uh, different uh, either politicians or scholars uh, have different views about uh, on, on that some say that there are no reason for any 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 fears uh, on russian side because uh, nato is a, de a defense alliance and uh, uh, they are there to protect their members on the other hand uh, uh, some uh, uh, also politicians and scholars uh, uh, i will uh, make a quotation of some Western uh, uh, experts. For instance, George Kennan, the architect of the, of the uh, containment uh, strategy of uh, uh, Russia uh, after the Second World War, or the Soviet Union, sorry, uh, uh, said uh, this, uh, bluntly stated, expanding NATO would be the most uh, fatal error of American policy in the entire post-Cold War era. Such a decision may be expected to restore the atmosphere of the Cold War to East-West relations and to impel Russian's foreign policy in directions decide, decidedly not to our liking. We know it is uh, quite famous that uh, Pope Francis uh, said uh, at the beginning of this war, sometime at the beginning, he, in, in an interview to Corriere della Sera, he said that uh, he believes that Russian intervention was uh, provoked by uh, a NATO barking uh, at the gate or at the door of, uh, of Russia. So uh, 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 Vladimir Putin himself. Now I, I, uh, I, I'm focusing on the, on, the, on, the, on the question whether there was uh, uh, any promise, uh, what is the legal value of, the, of, of such a promise? Okay, so uh, Vladimir Putin himself uh, uh, mentioned several times in several speeches, almost in all his speeches, almost in all his interviews, he mentions the fact that uh, I will make some quotations. I will uh, have a lot, uh, lots of quotations because in order to be precise, because those are uh, sensitive issues, so it's better to, to, to make quotations. He said uh, 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 on the 10th of uh, February 2007, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, Munich Security Conference, uh, where he openly criticized uh, uh, the U United States uh, uh, for its striving for a unipolar world, world uh, uh, for uh, unrestrained use of force, uh, and for its uh, disdain for international law. He said this, uh, uh, NATO has put put uh, its uh, frontline forces on our borders, and we do not react to these actions at all. At that time, they did not react. Uh, I think it is uh, obvious that NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. And we have the right to ask, against whom is this expansion intended? And what happened? To the assurances our Western partners made after the dissolution of Warsaw Pact, where are those declarations today? No one even remembers them. But I will allow myself to remind this audience what, I, uh, what was said. 
I would like to quote the speech of NATO General Secretary, Mr. Uh, Werner, in Brussels on the 7th May 1990. He said at the time that the fact, this is the quotation of Manfred Werner, uh, the fact that we are ready not to place a NATO army outside the, of German territory gives the Soviet Union a firm security guarantee. There are those guarantees. This is Putin in 2007. After the annexation of uh, Crimea, the, the, the Putin, uh, Putin uh, uh, had a speech before the uh, uh, state Duma deputies, before the members of the uh, Federation Council, and heads of Russian regions and representatives of civil society. And he said, uh, we are constantly proposing cooperation uh, on all key issues. We want to strengthen our level of trust uh, and for our relations to be equal, open and fair but we saw no reciprocal steps. On the contrary, we have uh, they have lied to us many times, made decisions behind our, our backs, placed us before an accomplished fact. Uh, uh, this happened with NATO extension to the East, as well as the deployment of military infrastructure at our borders. And then uh, at the beginning of the uh, special intervention uh, uh, in February, on the 24th of February, 2022, uh, Putin said, uh, yes, uh, uh, this uh, array includes promises not to expand NATO eastwards even by an inch, to reiterate, uh, they have deceived us, or to put it simply, they have played us. So Putin uh, repeats uh, uh, almost in every occasion he has uh, this uh, story. On the other hand, there are voices uh, that say that uh, what is he saying is complete nonsense and that is completely not true and that he is lying. He said that uh, NATO was lying. Uh, some say that Putin was lying. So our task tonight will be to catch the liar. Let's see who, who is the liar. Okay. So there is the, the, the Chatham House, there is a, on their internet site, there is a text, uh, myths and misconceptions on Russia. And myth number three uh, is Russia was promised that NATO would not enlarge. The author is somebody called John Love. I think it's Red Love. And uh, the text says he's associate fellow of, uh, of Russia and Eurasia uh, uh, program. He says, contrary to the betrayal narrative cultivated by Russia, uh, by Russia today, the USSR was never offered a formal guarantee on the limits of NATO expansion post-1990. Moscow merely distorts history to help preserve an anti-Western consensus at home. A professor of London School of Economics, uh, whose name is Christina Spohr, uh, uh, published an article uh, uh, entitled Exposing the Myth of Western Betrayal of Russia over NATO's Eastern Enlargement. Uh, and it begins with the 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia is still peddling the old myth of Western betrayal of Russia by expanding NATO eastwards after the end of Cold War. Both Vladimir Putin and his foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, have used this myth to demand formal Western security guarantees and that NATO rules our future membership for, uh, out future, uh, future membership for Ukraine and other ex-Soviet republics. And there is one thing I, I could just uh, uh, put stress on. Uh, uh, this Christina Spohr says that uh, uh, there is a principle which is fundamental to this uh, whole story disorder, and this is the principle of the uh, 1975 Helsinki Final Act, that each sovereign state is free to choose its own alliance. So the Eastern European states are free to, to, to choose whether they will be parts, uh, members of NATO and uh, uh, or not. That is true. They have the right to choose whether they want, uh, uh, will, or uh, whether they want or they don't want to be, to be members of NATO. But this is what we are speaking about is about NATO promises. So if you want to be a member of NATO, you can uh, uh, want it uh, uh, as much as you want if they do not want to take you. And if they have taken uh, an obligation not to extend their border, then they have to. Uh, comply to that duty and not to uh, admit them to the membership. So it is uh, uh, out of question uh, that, 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 that this uh, uh, invoking the, the Helsinki final act uh, is, uh, doesn't make any sense in this, in this whole story. 
there is also uh, uh, Mark Kramer, or Kramer, uh, who wrote also uh, a text, The Myth of the No NATO, uh, NATO Enlargement Pledge to Russia. And he says uh, this, at no point in the discussion did either Baker or Gorbachev bring up the question of the possible extension of NATO membership to other was affected countries beyond Germany. And he says also, indeed, it never would have occurred to them to raise an issue that was uh, not in the, on the ag uh, agenda anywhere, not in Washington, no, not in Moscow, and not in any Warsaw Pact uh, uh, or NATO capital. Uh, there are, on the other hand, there are some uh, witnesses of the, of the facts. And there are witnesses of two kinds. Some say, yes, there was a promise. Some say, no, there was not a promise. So at the end, we will have to see the documents and the transcripts of what was said. And that is the, 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 the chief, uh, uh, let's say, the chief uh, uh, evidence of what really happened. So those yes witnesses, for instance, uh, Anatoly Adamishin, uh, who was Soviet deputy foreign minister in 1990, claimed in 1997. That was the time when the, the, the uh, uh, ex expansion of NATO took place, uh, was prepared for, for first Eastern European <laughs> countries. Uh, he said, uh, uh, we were told during the German, uh, he was a Soviet deputy foreign minister in 1990. He said, we were told during the German reunification uh, process that NATO would not expand. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev made a, a similar uh, assertions in 1996, 1997, and then he changed that in 2014. Uh, then uh, Jack Matlock, the American uh, 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 ambassador to the US, uh, USSR in 1990, uh, he said uh, that Gorbachev received clear commitment that if Germany united, and stayed in NATO, the borders of NATO would not move eastward. And uh, Robert McNamara, he was the former US Defense Secretary, he said the United States pledged never to expand NATO eastward uh, if Moscow would agree to the unification of Germany. According, according to this view, uh, the Clinton administration reneged on this commitment when it decided to expand NATO to Eastern Europe. So those are some of the yes witnesses, there are other. There are no witnesses who say, no, it was not mentioned. That, uh, uh, some say it was uh, out of question at that time, it was an issue because uh, nobody thought at that time of, uh, of uh, uh, dismembering of also pact, etc. So uh, of withdrawing of, of uh, Russian for, uh, Soviet forces from uh, Eastern European countries, except Germany. So it was George, uh, George Bush senior, who was a participant in, in the whole story, uh, Brent uh, Scowcroft, uh, who was a US National Secretary Advisor, James Baker, who was a very important participant, uh, and uh, uh, Philip Zelikov, uh, uh, who was a senior official of the National Security Council, uh, staff responsible for German re re reunification uh, issues. And he said in 1997, the option of adding new uh, members of NATO was not uh, uh, foreclosed by the deal actually made in 1990. We can make a distinction between the deal that was a treaty which was, which was signed uh, in the September uh, uh, two plus four agreement, uh, two are the, the, the Germanys, the four are the former uh, occupying forces, uh, uh, Western and uh, uh, Soviet Union. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, let's see what happened, what, what happened uh, in the, in the uh, ne negotiation or before the negotiation, because the statement on press conferences or during the negotiations was something that we, which, is, which was, uh, 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 important, uh, which was valid for the for the for, uh, for the conclusion. Uh, 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 so uh, uh, okay, um, just let me. I have to skip because I was told that we have uh, five. I have five minutes. Mm -hmm. 
Now, let me first, uh, first uh, uh, there is some, uh, one important issue. Whether, whether the, the solution of uh, uh, was effect was uh, uh, something that was uh, 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 talked about or uh, thought about uh, at, at that time. So, uh, starting from September 19, uh, 1999, CIA in its, its report stated that uh, 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 the uh, Hungary, uh, Hungary uh, Hungarian authorities, the, the new authorities, would probably become increasingly uh, insistent on the withdrawal of Soviet troops from, uh, from uh, its territory, uh, and that almost uh, certainly any democratically elected government in the state uh, would uh, put uh, forward uh, uh, from the Russia, the, the, the agenda with the USSR. Uh, USSR. Uh, then there is uh, uh, in uh, the uh, in the press, uh, Washington Post, for instance, uh, 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 in January 1990, said Hungarian and Polish leaders uh, said they uh, want the all Soviet troops out of their countries in a year or two, and the score in the decrease rest in the solution of the uh, Warsaw Pact as a military alliance. Uh, I will just give you the, some some titles. Uh, 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 the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, uh, 30 years legacy, Los Angeles uh, Times, uh, 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 Hungarian Prime Minister reports that uh, Moscow had agreed to withdraw its troops, uh, 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 New York Times, Soviet Union informed Czechoslovakia to start a partial troop withdrawal, uh, 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 Washington Post, Soviet Union agrees to withdraw pro uh, troops from Hungary, uh, uh, Washington Post uh, was a pact uh, end game uh, in East Europe. The military alliance is dead. So all that, those uh, articles. So it is not true that it was out of the, that it was a non-issue. The, the, the newspaper, uh, the, 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 the press uh, speaking about it. There was a conference, press conference by Genscher in Tutzing uh, in uh, Bavaria, in which he said. Uh, whatever happens to the Warsaw Pact, uh, an expansion of NATO territory to the east uh, in uh, a diverse closure to the border of the Soviet Union will not happen. This current guarantee will be significant to the Soviet Union uh, and its attitude. The West must be guided by the realization of the changes in Eastern Europe, and the German unification process cannot be allowed to co uh, compromise Soviet security interests. Uh, uh, so there is a State Department account about a meeting of Genscher with Baker, uh, and it says, okay, this is internal Genscher Baker. It is inside NATO, so it doesn't. It's not a declaration to words. Uh, unlike a press conference, which is which can be considered as a declaration, uh, Genscher confirmed that uh, uh, neutrality for unified unify Germany is out of question. The new Germany, so it will be a member of NATO. The new Germany will remain in NATO because NATO is uh, an essential uh, building block uh, to a new Europe. In standing this, Genscher reiterated the need to assure the Soviets. Uh, that NATO would not extend its territorial coverage to the area of the General Democratic Republic, nor anywhere in the Eastern Europe for that matter. Then there is a, a Genscher Baker, Baker uh, 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 meeting, and there was a press conference on the 2nd of February 1990, and Genscher says, speaking uh, for both of them, uh, perhaps I might add, we were in full agreement that there is no intention to extend the NATO area of defense and the, security, uh, and the security towards the East. This holds true not only for the uh, German Democratic Republic, which we uh, have no intention to, uh, of simply comp uh, incorporating, but that holds true for all the other Eastern countries. So I won't continue. This, this is repeated several times in, uh, at this uh, press conference. In the meeting with Shevanadze, James Baker, on the 9th of, uh, there was a meeting of Baker with Shevanadze on the 9th of February. Uh, in the uh, in the morning and then uh, in the afternoon, which uh, did Gorbachev. Let 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 me let me finish with with what was said. This is the most important meeting. <laughs> huh? Okay, so. Uh, I, will, I will just take one at the, the, the uh, meeting with, with, with Gorbachev. Baker asked Gorbachev, I want to ask you uh, a question. 
and you need uh, not to answer it right now. Supposing unification takes place, what would you prefer? United Germany outside of NATO, absolutely independent and without American troops, or United Germany keeping its connection with NATO, but with the guarantees that NATO uh, is a jurisprudence, it was probably jurisdiction, uh, or troops uh, will not uh, spread the east uh, of the present boundary. And uh, Gorbachev says, it goes without saying that uh, uh, broadening of the NATO zone is not acceptable. And Baker says, we agree with that. Okay, there is also there a press conference which repeats that, etc. So the, the agreement that was uh, signed, it deals with the German issue, so it does not speak about, about extending NATO in, uh, in, in, in Eastern Europe. But there is an article which, uh, uh, as uh, Yeltsin said later, which keeps the spirit of that idea not to uh, undermine the security of, uh, uh, but anyway, what is important are those meetings and those press conferences at the time the decision was taken whether it will be, uh, whether the, uh, the will be, there will be a unification of Germany and whether there will be an extension of NATO. And okay, just uh, the legal value of, 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 of all this. Uh, there was uh, uh, the International Court of Justice uh, 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 decided about that uh, in its judgment, judgments uh, of the uh, 20th of December 1974 in cases uh, uh, of nuclear tests, uh, New Zealand versus France and uh, uh, Australia versus France. Uh, uh, there were some uh, uh, nuclear tests of uh, France in the, in, the, in, the, in the Southern Pacific. Uh, and New Zealand and Australia consider that uh, it is harmful to their uh, territory, uh, the radiation that is produced. And uh, uh, during the, this, uh, this uh, process, uh, French authorities, uh, ministers, even the, the, the president of the Republic, uh, stated several times that they will stop by the end of 1974, they will stop with those uh, 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 test that they will continue only with uh, 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 with tests which are not in that region and which are under the earth, so, so uh, that won't, won't produce those, those effects. And the court concluded, and I will have to read and I will finish with that. Uh, uh, it is uh, well recognized the declaration by, by way of unilateral acts concerning legal or factual situations may have the effect of creating legal obligations. Declarations of this kind may be, and often are, very specific. When uh, it is the intention of state making the declaration that uh, uh, it should become bound according to its terms, the intention confers uh, on the declaration uh, the, uh, the character of a legal, a legal undertaking, the state being uh, uh, thenceforth legally required to follow a course uh, of conduct uh, consistent I'm with sorry, the dear colleague. It's only okay. 25 minutes, so okay. could you give so us the be, substantific they can be, they can conclusion, <laughs> please, thank you. Okay, I might be saying something which uh, doesn't, which you, you might not li like, but okay, uh, yeah, I guess it is, uh, uh, it doesn't matter, okay, so it can be, it can be in, informal, it should be public declaration, it should be open, so it should be, it should be, it doesn't matter who it is addressed to, but it's a public declaration made by, 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 by the authorities of the state, especially by the president of the state, Minister of Foreign Affairs, it took place here, and, uh, and, uh, uh, members of the government uh, that produces legal effect it is binding so if we ask who uh, is juridique qui est contre quoi laga oni ke gažu da ne postoji ništa obavezujuće u tome ti koji legally the dog was barking in a no barking area thank you Merci, merci beaucoup, euh, me, monsieur le professeur, pour, euh, pour cet euh, cette exposé euh, très détaillé euh, qui a insisté sur. Euh, ah, sorry, sorry. Euh, euh, sur cet exposé qui a insisté sur les faits, mais qui sont importants, euh, qui sont controversés, et, 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 et sur la question de, de, de l'effet d'un acte unilatéral, du promesse. Évidemment, euh, la question de la preuve est une question centrale. Et, et, et si la question de la preuve est une question centrale, alors, 
celle des faits est aussi une question centrale et c'est ce que, ce que vous avez présenté euh, aussi euh, pendant, euh, de manière très détaillée dans votre, dans votre exposé. Euh, pour ajouter, mais il y aura des questions, il y aura des questions et j'en aurai même à vous poser peut-être. Donc, euh, 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 wait a minute. Et donc, on va aussi, à présent, écouter euh, le professeur Tanassier Marinkovic qui euh, va aborder la question de, du droit à la sécession unilatérale avec euh, celle de la question de la Crimée et du Kosovo, où là aussi, euh, le droit est important, mais euh, là aussi, la question des faits euh, et, et, et de la situation concrète a euh, son, son importance. Euh, donc voilà, 15-20 minutes. So very strict, Mr. President, with 15 minutes. Okay, so um, I'm going to start my presentation also with a couple of quotes of uh, Vladimir Putin. They're quite uh, uh, <clears throat> enchanting. In a number of uh, public addresses, very often labeled as historic speeches, and indeed it delivered at the turning points of the recent history. Russian President Vladimir Putin repeatedly made references to the status of Kosovo and the way it was amputated from Serbia in order to justify Russian actions in, in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. On March 18, 2014, two days after the so-called referendum in which Crimea voted to reunite with Russia, 82% of, of the electorate took part in the vote, out of which 96% voted in favor of the given proposal. Putin delivered a speech in which he announced the adoption of the constitutional law on the creation of the new constituent units, the Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol. To support this action of the Crimean people and the Russian Federation, <clears throat> he referred to the United Nations Charter proclamation on the right of nations to self-determination. In the next step, he invoked a precedent, I'm quoting, a precedent of our Western colleagues which created with their own hands in a very similar situation when they agreed that the unilateral separation of Kosovo from Serbia, exactly what Crimea is doing now, was legitimate and did not require any permission from the country's central authorities. And this is not the only, this is not the only statement of Vladimir Putin, in which he makes references to uh, Kosovo and comparisons between uh, eastern Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, Crimea on one side and Kosovo on the other side and um, uh, secession of uh, eastern uh, Ukrainian provinces, oblasts um, uh, and, uh, and Kosovo on the other side. I will not continue quoting because uh, there are quite quite a few of those speeches, um, and uh, they're actually quite uh, quite repetitive in their um, um, in their substance. I will um, in this paper in this in this presentation, I will try to look at um, the meaning of the right uh, of self determination, what actually it means under the international law. Um, especially under the 1945 United Nations Charter and the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and 1970 Declaration, which we heard today on the friendly relationships between, between the nations. Then I will look at the, at the change of the paradigm uh, after the um, late 80s and early 90s um, to, take, uh, to take George Bush's uh, words after the new world order was, was established. And from that perspective, because this is actually the paradigm that Putin is referring to, I will look at the, his arguments regarding uh, <clears throat> the legitimacy of, uh, of the right to secession of uh, uh, Crimea on one side and um, uh, Donbas and other provinces on the other side. So uh, for that purpose, I will just open, like René Magritte, uh, I will say this is not a pipe, ceci n'est pas une pipe. 
because compared to Nina's presentation and the presentation which our colleagues had yesterday, this is not a presentation. Uh, this is just a tool to help us uh, go better through these international documents. Um, so, so we need to understand actually what, what the international law says about the right to self-determination. And the first reference to it is in the 1945 United Nations Charter. Um, the self-determination of peoples, this is what is uh, stated uh, in the passage to develop friendly relations, so these are the purposes of the United Nations, to develop friendly relations among nations based on respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples and to take other appropriate measures to strengthen universal peace. At that time, when we look at the travaux preparatoire, that term meant actually very little. Uh, and what is interesting, the right to self-determination entered under the influence of the Soviet delegates at the San Francisco conference. Um, later on, it was actually the initial idea was to set up some principles in the charter and then to continue developing it through the uh, subsequent documents. And one of those documents is International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. But let me just say at this stage that um, when it comes to the place and the meaning of self-determination of peoples in the Charter, that the Travaux Preparatoire point to the fact that um, uh, Soviets insisted that it as a collective right, and they had in mind colonized people. On the other side, Western states had in mind self-determination of peoples as an individual right, and they understood it as a right to self-governance. So from the very beginning, um, first of all, the, the very right matured for quite some time. And then, as we will see, it became even, um, it continued to stay quite um, basic and undefined. So in the 1966 covenant, um, there is more substance on it. And the first, already in the first article, there is right to self-determination. All peoples have the right of self-determination. By virtue of this right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. So this is the Western understanding of the right of self-determination. It is understood as a right to a democratic, not despotic government. And in that sense, uh, a right of the people to choose to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development as well as political status, but also to be free from external influences. So there is, this, there is that aspect of the right of self-determination. Sovereignty in both uh, meanings as a supremacy of that collectivity, but also its independence vis-a-vis -vis other collectivities. Um, then there was uh, understanding of, um, of the right uh, of self-determination as an economic, uh, actually as a, as a right of people to dispose of their natural natural wealth that was uh, 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 introduced into the covenant as a result of certain um, uh, representatives of the third world, third world countries. And then there is another understanding which is related to the, again, um, people who will colonize or dependent people as, it, as they were called uh, that, at that time and their right of self-determination. So this was, um, uh, this was the part which was the least disputed uh, the right to, of self-determination was understood as a, um, as a tool, as a right, uh, which would lead to the decolonization of the uh, colonial empires. Um, 1970 Declaration on Principles of International Law, Friendly Relations and Cooperation Among States in Accordance with the Charter of the United Nations um, stipulates um, that uh, uh, make, makes reference to the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation. It explicitly states the right of self-determination, but it precises at the same time in the saving clause that that right to self-determination implies internal self-determination, except for the situations when there is um, a, a government which is uh, basically discriminatory on the basis of um, uh, race, creed, and color. So to sum up the state of um, the state of international law at that stage at 1970, uh, and it will continue to be like that for um, 
for another decade uh, or uh, almost two decades, the right to self-determination was considered, um, first of all, as an internal right to self-determination in terms of democratic, having a right to have a democratic government. And then um, exceptionally as a right to external self-determination um, in cases concerning uh, colonized people, in cases of foreign occupation, and um, in these instances, when there are governments of, let's say, apartheid, in which uh, there is a severe, the severe um, discrimination on the basis of race, uh, creed, or color. So the declaration makes reference to uh, race and color for some historic reasons. Basically, it's a, it's a, it's a race. And creed, under creed, the, the drafters meant the religious um, um, uh, uh, the religion as a basis. So it is, a, in other words, it is only under that condition that uh, a, a right to external self-determination self appears as a right and uh, it is a case, it is a case of, of uh, discriminatory regimes on the basis of race and religion. Only on those two bases declaration introduces uh, this right. Um, with the with the demise of the bipolar world, um, the, the, as, as, as uh, George Bush put it uh, in, a, in address to Congress um, on 11th September, September 11th, about 1990, um, he, made, uh, he made a speech which uh, became very symbolic. Uh, many recognized in it the end of history, in his words. And um, he explained his vision of the world, and that is the world in which, um, uh, according to him, it's a big idea, a new world where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind, peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. He further on explained that his understanding of the new world order, new world order was an order in which the big states would protect the small states whenever their the injustices is done to them and uh, therefrom comes another reading and another understanding of um, of um, uh, of of uh, involvement engagement intervention of uh, uh, states in the affairs of other states um, and that missionary understanding of um, uh, uh, of uh, so to say of expulsion of uh, uh, of export of democracy comes uh, actually in a way from our French, uh, um, like many big political ideas come, come from France. It comes from the French left because the, the idea was much earlier presented by, uh, by Bernard Kushner and um, um, uh, being at the head of the, um, uh, of the Médecins Sans Frontières, so Doctors Without Frontiers. Uh, he, witness himself as, as well as many of his colleagues of many of the injustices which were committed to the people that they were um, providing the basic needs. Um, so what is interesting is that um, that Kushner uh, uh, presented the Le droit d'ingérence, so the, the, the right of interference, um, not just as a right to interfere um, and not just as a right to bomb and to, to leave, but actually under certain conditions, a uh, right to stay. Because he says it is needed to make the, the work of reconstruction, even of the state construction, uh, to avoid the situation in which um, another need for intervention would, um, would appear. And basically this extended understanding of the right to, uh, of the right of interference uh, was um, uh, presented in the, uh, uh, received certain international recognition in 2005 United Nations resolution on the responsibility to protect. And there the, the resolution stipulates that the international community through the United Nations also has the responsibility to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian and other peaceful means to help protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing and crimes against humanity. Uh, nevertheless, in this context, uh, we are prepared to take collective action in a timely and decisive manner through the Security Council in accordance with the Charter, including cha Chapter 7. So <laughs> even then, uh, under this resolution, there is no way to avoid the application of, uh, of the Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. So you, 
that need has to be the approval of the Security Council um, uh, uh, of the Security Council. Kushner, who whose whose words, um, United Nations Security Council. So the Kushner, whose words uh, um, depict well the spirit of the time, went even further. But and he said that there is need also to stay in certain instances. So to basically, uh, basically to amputate when it is needed one um, a land, uh, one part of the land from a, from an existing state, and to create a state if needed uh, on that land. So this is. Uh, and there were already references to to, to these uh, interventions um, in that period, without the approval of the Security Council of the United Nations Security Council, um, more specifically Iraq, Libya, and Syria, and previously, of course, uh, the, the the aggression on Yugoslavia, which, uh, as I said, uh, symbolizes uh, maybe maybe at best this new paradigm. It was then further on further on developed by certain political philosophers, such as uh, Alan Buchanan, who wrote a huge book explaining that the principles of international law should change, that peace should not be the basic value of international law, but justice, and that um, um, uh, basically to simplify uh, 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 justifying in, in, in some instances these kind of uh, actions. Now, these are, I made this on, uh, I put this second stage as well on purpose because Putin regularly makes references to this to, to this period and to this um, um, and to this uh, and to this um, um, uh, state uh, of interpretation of international law by the western colleagues western partners as he, as he put uh, now he also he also makes references to the situation in ukraine and uh, again in a number of speeches explain the historic relationship between the ukraine and russia the unity of the two uh, the two nations um, he also uh, regularly criticizes the, um, the, 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 the present government, especially since 2014 in, in the Ukraine. Uh, with, without giving any proofs, he accuses the government of, uh, of the rise of far-right nationalism, um, of Russophobia, and of neo-Nazism. Uh, now, today, especially um, since, these, since the aggression started, it is very difficult to enter into the facts and to discern what is right and what is what is fake, what is true and what is fake. And for that purpose, I went into the documents which were made before this, uh, this aggression, uh, and uh, also to the acts of the institutions um, in which Russia participated and in which it had the opportunity to use the necessary tools to object this state of affairs in Ukraine, if it is true. More specifically, I looked at the, at the case law of the European Court of Human Rights, uh, at the cases uh, against Ukraine, um, especially cases related to the Articles 2, so right to life, prohibition of torture, and 14, discrimination. Because I think when we speak of Nazism, we mean that kind of regime which killed people, the machine which killed people on the basis of, and tortured people, of course, on the basis of their beliefs, on the basis of their race, on the basis of, um, uh, of their ethnicity. And uh, for that purpose, I looked at those uh, articles and those cases which are relevant for this, uh, for this analysis in this light. I also looked, I know very well, some will say, those are individual applications, when they come here, there is a judge as well. He can explain us. It takes a long time. Maybe it's not, you know, it occurred in 2019, 2020, and so forth. Um, I looked also at the reports of the ECRI, of the Council of Europe's Commission uh, uh, Against Discrimination and Racism. And I also found, I looked at the reports of the Advisory Committee uh, of the Framework, Framework Convention on the Minority Rights also a Council of Europe body. What I looked, what I found there are the references indeed to the presence of um, uh, extreme right and uh, 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 elements of racism in Ukraine. Um, also references to uh, Stepan Bandera and that's not just the Council of Europe which condemned the revival of that past but also uh, the uh, Parliament, European Union Parliament, in, uh, in, its, uh, in its declaration. So there is reference to it. 
but not at all to the extent to which we would be uh, able to say that there is a revival of the Nazism that we have seen in the previous period, and which would, I, mean, I refer to, of course, um, to the German Nazism in, um, in the period between the two world wars and during the, the, the Second World War. Um, as a conclusion, I would like to say that um, it's, a, it's a very, to make a point, I make a match with, uh, what, with what Miodrag was saying um, yesterday about uh, the specificities of the international order, uh, international legal order. It's a primitive legal order. It's a primitive legal order um, in the sense, as Hart put it, uh, there is no a rule of recognition in the full meaning of the word. We don't know till the end what are actually the sources of international law. Um, we, um, there is a problem with the rule of execution. There is a problem with the rule of adjudication. We don't have the police to apply that law. We don't have um, the judiciary with the jurisdiction like European Court of Human Rights said, and I mean, the, uh, Vladimir was making reference to it. So it's a, it's a bit, uh, for, it is exactly for that purpose that I took the Council of Europe as, a, as an example of a body where Russia could participate to prove the things. Uh, nevertheless, it's a, it's a primitive legal order, and I, I think we have, to, we have to live with it. We have to accept it as such, and we have to accord our behavior in, a, uh, in line with its nature. So there is no state to protect us. Uh, we are in a certain state of nature, I mean, uh, not fully, but in a certain state of nature uh, in the international arena. And there you have to, there you have to uh, be aware of what the big powers are doing and what are their expectations. So this is a very important um, uh, uh, you know, uh, conclusion that we can make out of this, uh, uh, out of this uh, uh, episode. But also small nations are more, even more aware of that fact that they have to look at what the big powers are doing. On the other side, and I finish, I think uh, to make again uh, another reference to, to what I was, and to elaborate on it more, Yesterday, to what was I, was I was saying yesterday in the opening speech, there I was speaking on behalf of the, of the uh, organizing committee, so I wasn't able to go further. As a constitutional, as a constitutional law, lawyer, I make the reference to the Article 16 of our Constitution, which imposes upon us to make our foreign policy, um, uh, to, to, make, to uh, accord our foreign policy and to lead it in accordance with the, um, uh, the principles um, um, of international law, uh, rec recognized, uh, recognized principles of international law. I think there is also a moral responsibility of Serbia. <coughs> Serbia was a country which was uh, an object of aggression. It was a country which lived in the in a recent history, that we are all aware of, in an authoritarian regime. And we knew very well what it means to be in that kind of regime. I think, and I finish by that, I think very much of the Russians who live in Russia who is not anymore member of the Council of Europe. Russia left Council of Europe mid of uh, uh, mid March. And even that little protection, which those citizens had, um, those citizens had does not exist anymore. Serbia was in that situation. It knows very well what it means. And as a small nation, of course, it cannot act like big nations, but it has words. And it could be more consistent with its position when it comes to this uh, war. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Professor uh, Marinkovic. De, de, de terminer par cette, euh, cette réflexion sur la responsabilité morale de, 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 de la Serbie, ou en tout cas de, de pays qui ont souffert, ou de peuples qui ont pu souffrir aussi. Euh, et je crois que c'est très important d'avoir de, 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 évoqué cette question-là. Euh, la question quand même de la souffrance, puisque, euh, alors là, il y a majoritairement des, des juristes, mais le, le, le droit, ça n'est pas, pas que réfléchir à des concepts. Euh, le droit, c'est aussi, aussi du concret, c'est aussi de la souffrance. Euh, et, 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 et il faut penser aussi aux conséquences 
euh, qu'il y a euh, lorsque l'on exécute ou pas une obligation internationale et euh, aux conséquences contraires qui, qui, qui peuvent arriver dans, dans un ordre international compliqué, euh, anarchique, euh, disait euh, rapidement à l'instant euh, le, le, le professeur Jovanovic, euh, alors je, à qui je cède la parole en précisant que l'anarchie, ce n'est pas forcément le désordre, c'est une autre forme d'ordre. Merci beaucoup Hugo. Euh, je vous invite à reprendre vos. Enfin, take back your devices since I will speak in French. Euh, merci. Euh, j'ai parlé pas mal de fois euh, jusqu'ici. J'ai pas eu l'occasion de remercier les organisateurs de ce colloque. Je pense colloque très réussi et sur un sujet très important. Donc j'aimerais profiter de l'occasion. Je ne sais pas s'ils nous écoutent présentement, mais l'équipe bordelaise, Loïc Gras, Sébastien Platon, Philippe Claret. Euh, mes salutations et bien sûr le professeur Tanasi Marinkovic pour avoir donné et dépensé beaucoup d'énergie pour nous réunir aujourd'hui et hier. Il ne s'agit pas que du colloque international, il s'agit aussi de l'école d'automne qu'on a avec les étudiants. Et merci pour tout ça et merci de m'avoir fait participer à cette petite mais importante aventure. Je dirais ça comme ça. Euh, nous avons commencé ce colloque en parlant du droit. Et avant même d'avoir écouté notre... Cher collègue Miodra Jovanovic, qui nous a livré une leçon inaugurale, on peut dire ça comme ça, axée sur la théorie du droit et donc sur la nature du droit international, avant même qu'il ait pris la parole, dans les, on va dire dans les discours d'ouverture de notre doyen et de son excellence l'ambassadeur de France en Serbie, M. Pierre Cocher, ces termes ont été employés. Alors je vais citer dans le texte, le doyen de la faculté de droit de Belgrade, donc notre collègue professeur Zora Mirkovic, avait dit, je cite, « The Russian invasion fundamentally undermined the international legal order. » Et peu de temps après, puisqu'il s'est adressé après lui, euh, son excellence Pierre Cochard avait dit plus ou moins la même, la même chose, quasiment avec les mêmes mots, en disant que l'agression russe est une remise en cause du droit international. Alors tout à l'heure, j'ai paraphrasé, je ne l'ai pas bien cité, il n'a pas dit démantelé, donc c'est une remise en cause du droit international. Et je pense que cette référence au droit international n'est pas fortuite et qu'elle est hautement significatif, significative, si vous voulez, du fait que en ces temps troubles et incertains, et il s'agit de temps troubles et incertains, on cherche une, un cadre de référence. Et que, somme toute, il est tout à fait logique de rechercher ce cadre de référence dans le droit international, qui pose des normes, qui définit des normes juridiques assez précises au demeurant, et qui répondent aux questions posées par ce conflit. J'ai en cité trois principales. Le recours à la force, la question du droit à l'autodétermination dont Tanasi Marinkwitsch a fait état tout à l'heure, et puis bien évidemment le principe de l'intégrité territoriale des États. Alors, avant de me... et d'aller un peu plus en amont dans mon propos, et de l'approfondir, parce qu'on a parlé pas mal de droit international, sans vraiment, jusque l'intervention de Tanasi Marinkwitsch, sans vraiment parler des normes précises du droit international, j'ai envie de faire quelques remarques liminaires, si vous me permettez. La première remarque, quand je parle du droit international, et quand je parle des mirages ou du mirage du droit international, je pense principalement, pour ne pas dire exclusivement, au droit de la paix et de la sécurité internationale. Pour faire court, je parle de la sécurité collective, ou plus ou moins des principes définis par la Charte des Nations Unies de 1945. Deuxième remarque liminaire, alors, elle est d'ordre épistémologique. C'est un peu pompeux, c'est peut-être même un peu prétentieux, mais je pense que c'est important de la faire, d'autant que les deux jours de débat qu'on a eu ici me, me confirment dans l'idée qu'il est important, qu'il est vraiment important de faire cette remarque. Et quand je dis épistémologique, je pense à quoi Je pense que quand il s'agit d'apprécier l'effectivité ou l'autorité du droit international, on est forcément, et je dis une banalité d'ailleurs, on est forcément influencé par l'expérience qu'on a du droit international, de sa violation, ou, alors, j'ai employé deux grands mots, ça va dépendre entièrement, ou quasiment entièrement, de notre statut de bourreau ou de victime. Alors, de manière un peu plus claire, je pense qu'on a une appréhension, une compréhension du droit international qui diffère entièrement selon qu'on est serbe ou irakien, ou qu'on est américain. Fondamentalement, elle diffère et fondamentalement, elle joue sur notre connaissance du droit international parce qu'on est 
comme dans toutes les sciences humaines, quelque peu objectif. Enfin, quelque peu subjectif, pardonnez-moi. Et en ce sens, je comprends fort bien la plaisanterie assez amère dont nous a fait état Miodrag Yovanovic hier. Il a relaté la plaisanterie des étudiants ukrainiens qui disent « Bon, on a un cours de droit international demain, mais pourquoi y aller puisque le droit international n'existe pas ?» Alors, ils ont pu écouter Art ou Kelsen ou Koyev, peu importe. Pour eux, ils le vivent dans leur chair, l'inexistence du droit international. Bon. Et troisième remarque liminaire, mon propos ne sera pas d'ordre théorique. Je vais tenir un propos beaucoup plus pratique que théorique et conceptuel, même si à la fin, je toucherai deux, trois mots sur la théorie du droit international, sachant que je ne suis pas expert dans la théorie du droit, y compris le droit international. Alors, ces remarques étant faites, je, dans une première partie, je ferai état de ces normes bien précises du droit international et je ferai état de leur application tout à fait incohérente et sélective pour voir dans un second temps, bah finalement, qu'il n'y a rien de nouveau sous le soleil, que peut-être ça peut nous étonner, mais que ça a été comme ça depuis la création de la sécurité collective imparfaite du temps de la société des nations, un peu plus élaborée avec, le, avec les Nations unies. Donc premier point, enfin première partie, quel est ce droit positif en question et qu'est-ce qu'il dit Les trois normes, je vous les ai citées, recours à la force, ensuite droit des peuples à l'autodétermination, et finalement, qu'est-ce que veut dire le principe d'intégrité territoriale en droit international Alors, je vais essayer d'être bref. Il me reste 14 minutes, peut-être un peu plus si on prend les précédents avec Branko Rokic et même Tanasi Marinkovic. Recours à la force. Olivier Corten, représentant de l'école belge du droit international, a tout à fait raison, je pense, quand il parle non plus de « ius ad bellum », mais il parle du « ius contra bellum ». Pourquoi je pense qu'il a raison parce que depuis la Charte des Nations Unies, le recours à la force est interdit et prohibé. Nous n'avons pas le droit en tant qu'État à user de la force dans les relations interétatiques, dans les relations internationales. Et cette règle, ce principe ne connaît que deux exceptions, pas trois, pas quatre, que deux, et vous sont bien connues. La première exception, l'article 42 de la Charte, qui dit « on peut... » Why you can't hear anything? Don't, don't make me speak English. No, 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 no. I have to go slowly in this. No, they can really, they can't hear the translation. No, they have some, on him to have a technical problem. We technical problem. It's my fault or their fault? No, 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 it's their, it's, it's the second. It's Putin's fault or, or, or Biden's fault? I don't know. If, It's never the French for this. I don't know because it's not a great power. It's a, it's a middle power now. So it's not power at all right now. Middle force. Middle middle force. It's a CIA sabotage. Ah. I can try to continue in English. That's not my best language, of course. C'est bon. Magnifique. Si si, il faut remettre. Est-ce que vous suivez la traduction Allons, enfants de la patrie. Le jour de gloire n'est pas arrivé. Parti comme nous sommes. Peu importe. Donc, que deux exceptions sont connues de ce principe. Donc, l'article 42 de la charte, qui admet la possibilité d'un recours à la force avec l'autorisation du Conseil de sécurité, et l'article 51 sur la défense. Vous suivez sur le droit de légitime défense, individuelle ou collective d'ailleurs. Je ne citerai pas les dispositions pertinentes dans le texte. Et mis à part ces deux exceptions, il n'y a rien d'autre, c'est-à-dire le recours à la force préventive ou le droit de la guerre, la guerre préventive n'existe pas en droit positif international, il n'est pas permis. L'intervention humanitaire n'est pas autorisée davantage. La seule, on va dire, le seul cas qui existe, c'est la fameuse intervention consentie. Un État peut appeler un autre État à sa rescousse, à, la, à sa défense. Bon. Qui, qui est très intéressant, d'ailleurs, comme cas. Alors, c'est assez compliqué à mettre en œuvre et à juger, parce qu'il y a des conditions, il faut que la demande émane d'une autorité haute de l'État, et puis il faut que la demande soit valide. Il faut qu'elle soit préalable à l'intervention militaire, il faut qu'elle soit précise, pertinente, etc., etc., noviciée, bon. Donc c'est clair, pas de recours à la force, mis à part ces deux exceptions. Droit à l'autodétermination des peuples. 
il n'existe pas en droit international positif en dehors des cas de décolonisation. Dans son volet ou aspect externe, on n'a pas le droit, sinon, sinon, si nous sommes une minorité, de nous séparer de l'État pour créer un nouvel État. Ça n'existe pas en tant que droit en droit international. Il existe un droit interne à l'autodétermination. Alors ça aussi, c'est très particulier. Qu'est-ce que dit le droit international positif sur la question Il dit qu'effectivement, si il y a une minorité homogène dans un pays, elle a droit à une certaine autonomie, à utiliser sa langue, à avoir des droits culturels, etc. etc. Alors je dis que c'est particulier parce qu'il y a des États, la France notamment, qui ne connaît même pas de concept de minorité dans son droit public. La France échappe à cette provision, à ces dispositions du droit international général. La France n'a pas de minorité en droit. Elle en a plein, sociologiquement et dans les faits, mais elle n'en a pas en droit. Donc, même cette exception qui existe en droit positif est quelque peu relative. Et il y a cette fameuse théorie de la sécession remède, remedial secession. Moi, je n'y crois pas. Mon cher professeur Rakic y croit un peu plus. Elle a une certaine logique. Alors, l'autre jour, je pense que Miodor Yovanovic en parlait comme élément politique. Alors, je, je paraphrase. Elle a sa source dans des documents très précis et très bien élaborés. La source de la théorie de la sécession remède se trouve dans les rapports d'experts et des juristes sur le problème des îles Hollande. Des îles Hollande, qui est d'ailleurs un très bon rapport, qui a donné beaucoup de, de, de matière à l'élaboration du droit à l'autodétermination. Alors, qu'est-ce que veut dire la sécession remède Elle veut dire, si une minorité n'a pas réussi à obtenir l'autodétermination interne, une sorte d'autonomie, et si elle est soumise à des violations massives des droits fondamentaux, elle peut, en réaction, faire sécession. Il n'y a pas de consentement, ni dans la doctrine, ni dans la pratique, quant à l'existence positive de cette norme de la, de la sécession remède ou du droit à l'autodétermination par la théorie de la sécession remède. À ce point que lorsqu'il y avait l'avis consultatif de la CIJ concernant le Kosovo et la Métoshi et la déclaration unilatérale d'indépendance, il y a des pays qui ont soutenu la sécession remède, et il y en a beaucoup d'autres qui n'ont pas soutenu cette même sécession. Donc il n'y a pas de consentement sur la question. Intégrité territoriale, je finis avec ça pour, le, pour les dispositions, pour les normes positives. Alors ça, c'est la seule question un peu ambiguë. Certains auteurs pensent que le principe d'intégrité territoriale n'est qu'interétatique, qui ne défend pas, ne protège pas un État de troubles internes, qui ne protège pas un État de la sécession. C'est l'avis d'Alain Pelet, c'est l'avis de toute la commission sur l'affaire du Québec, c'est l'avis aussi de la CIJ dans l'avis constitutif sur le Kosovo. Ils disent que c'est un principe qui ne défend pas, ne, ne protège pas un État d'une sécession, de, de, de troubles internes. Et puis il y a une autre école qui dit non, non, le principe d'intégrité territoriale est absolu. Il protège un État aussi bien d'une agression extérieure que de troubles internes, sécessionnistes, etc. etc. Bon. Et là, il y a débat. La pratique internationale va plutôt dans le sens du second point de vue. Que ce soit la Moldavie à la Transnistrie, que ce soit l'Azerbaïdjan au Haut-Karabakh, la Géorgie avec l'Abkhazie du Sud et le CETI, du Sud, l'Abkhazie et le CETI du Sud, la Bosnie-Herzégovine avec la République serbe et la Fédération de Russie avec la Tchétchénie, la pratique des institutions internationales, dont l'ONU, a été de dire non, l'intégrité territoriale est un principe absolu. Bon, pour la Tchétchénie, la Russie n'avait pas de résolution de, 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 des Nations Unies. Mais il y avait des déclarations, alors j'en ai ici quelques-unes, des Français, des Anglais, des, des conseils juridiques, qui disaient très, très exactement la même chose. Bon. Alors, on a notre, nos normes, très précises, hein. il n'y a pas de mystère là-dedans, et là-dessus. Appliquons les faits aux normes, ou les normes aux faits. Quand on examine le cas de la Russie par rapport à l'Ukraine, ben c'est très simple, et je vais faire très court. La République populaire de Donetsk et la République populaire de Lugansk n'avait pas le droit à l'autodétermination externe, puisque ce droit n'existe pas. L'intervention armée de la Fédération de Russie peut être qualifiée d'agression du point de vue du droit international, et elle correspond assez bien à la résolution 3314 de l'Assemblée générale des Nations unies, qui définit l'agression, c'est en 1974. Et quand on regarde, et je viendrai dans la discussion sur les arguments avancés par les Russes, il n'y en a aucun qui tient véritablement la route au regard des normes de droit international. Et là, je dis ça en m'inscrivant uniquement dans le domaine du droit international. 
Moi, j'avais dit tout à l'heure, c'est une crise géopolitique avant tout. Et quand on vient sur le terrain de la géopolitique et de la politique, j'ai une opinion, mais très argumentée, par ailleurs, politique, peut-être subjective, mais argumentée. La responsabilité de cette guerre se trouve à l'ouest du Dniepr, et pour être tout à fait précis et franc, à l'ouest de l'océan Atlantique. Elle est bien davantage au Washington qu'elle n'est à Moscou, la responsabilité de cette guerre. Mais on revient dans le domaine du droit pur, pour ne pas reprendre Kelsen, les choses sont claires, on est dans l'illégalité totale. Sauf que ce n'est pas la première fois. Sauf que ça ne nous change absolument pas. Et là, j'aurais bien aimé que son excellence soit présent. Deux. Alors, je ne sais pas si j'ai fait une erreur. Pierre Cochard, ça ne nous change absolument pas de tout ce qui a été fait depuis les années 90. Notamment en Serbie. L'intervention de l'OTAN contre la République fédérale de Yougoslavie est une agression pure et simple, pareillement conforme à la résolution 3314 de l'Assemblée générale de 1974. Identique. Juridiquement parlant. Historiquement, moralement, on est dans le terrain, sur le terrain strict du droit. Il en va de même pour l'Irak en 2003, il en va de même pour la Libye en 2011. Agression après agression, avec une interprétation très très large de la résolution en 1973 qui instaure une exclusion aérienne de vol. Bon. Et j'ai un peu de temps. Je vais vous citer Marcelo Cohen, qui est un grand juriste, professeur de droit international à Genève. Alors, il est argentin, c'est très bizarre, on revient sur, à mon épistémologie. Argentine, les Malouines, Grande-Bretagne, ça joue, tout joue, comme notre cher collègue Moldave nous a expliqué la, la position géopolitique de la Moldavie. Il a un certain un avis, argumenté d'ailleurs, sur ce qui se passe actuellement et par rapport à la Russie. Marcelo Cohen, c'est en 2014, dans le temps, donc, journal suisse, si je ne me trompe pas. Je vais essayer d'être très lent. Dixit, si l'on examine l'intervention russe en Crimée, donc c'était la première phase de, de la crise, hein, 2014-2015, république autonome au sein de l'Ukraine, forcé de constater que l'action du Kremlin est contraire au droit international. C'est ce que les capitales occidentales rappellent avec force et vigueur tous les jours depuis le début de la présence des troupes russes dans l'ensemble de la péninsule au bord de la mer Noire. In Crimea. Seulement voilà, les accusateurs font-ils preuve de cohérence Ce sont les mêmes qui ont encouragé par tous les moyens la sécession du Kosovo, soutenu celle du Soudan du Sud, utilisé la force sans autorisation du Conseil de sécurité et mener une politique qui a conduit au fractionnement de facto de l'Irak, de l'Afghanistan et de la Libye. Ils ont provoqué un malheur incroyable dans tous ces pays. C'est moi qui rajoute ça, parce qu'il y a une doctrine de la guerre juste aussi. Je continue. Après l'annonce du Parlement de la Crimée d'organiser un référendum pour décider du sort du territoire et de le rattacher à la Russie, Washington et Bruxelles se sont empressés de déclarer son illégalité, car contraire à la constitution de l'Ukraine et au droit international, ce qui est vrai. Sauf que, continue Marcelo Cohen, le problème est que si l'on suit les arguments américains, britanniques, français et allemands, employés il n'y a pas si longtemps pour justifier la sécession du Kosovo, on arrive à des conclusions qui rendent surprenant l'émoi de ces gouvernements aujourd'hui. Et je vous passe la suite. Il y a beaucoup de choses très intéressantes sur l'ingérence américaine dans la crise de l'Ukraine, ce que disait notre ami russe, notre collègue russe tout à l'heure, qui, pareillement, est une violation du droit international du principe de non-ingérence dans les affaires intérieures des États, violation grave des principes pluralistes du droit international. Mais je vous passe tout ceci. J'en arrive à la conclusion de Marcelo Cohen, puisqu'il me reste 4-5 minutes. À force d'ignorer, et ça c'est en guise de conclusion quasiment, à force d'ignorer les règles de base qui régissent les relations internationales, en invoquant de faux arguments juridiques, ou en prétendant que les actions en question 
ne constituait pas de précédent à force de favoriser le morcellement des États, d'imposer une culture de la force dans les relations internationales, power politics culture, ceux qui prétendent représenter les valeurs démocratiques sur la scène internationale, je reviens à ce que disait Tassa, ont fini par affaiblir, ont fini par affaiblir l'ossature du droit international et le système de sécurité collective. En ceci, le discours de George Bush est une pure illusion de 1990 en septembre. Bon. Ma deuxième partie, vite fait, en deux minutes, s'il vous plaît, si vous permettez. Je vais me concentrer. Rien de nouveau sous le soleil, mes chers amis et collègues. Déjà, il faut savoir qu'en 1914, quand l'Autriche-Hongrie avait déclaré la guerre à la Serbie, le Yusad Belum existait en tant que tel. C'était tout à fait légal. On pouvait déclarer la guerre. Donc, il ne faut pas non plus être trop, exig trop exigeant avec le droit international. Le droit contre la guerre n'existe que depuis 1945. Bon, allez, depuis 20, avec la SDN qui a essayé un peu de réguler, de régir, sans vraiment l'interdire, le recours à la force. Et malheureusement, ça n'a jamais véritablement marché. La SDN n'a pas réussi à contenir ni le Japon, ni l'Allemagne, ni l'Italie, d'ailleurs, 35, 31, Mandchourie, Éthiopie, ce que vous voulez. Et la charte des Nations Unies, à partir de 1945, n'a pas régi et régulé les relations internationales. C'est l'équilibre des puissances qui l'a fait. Vous aviez plus de 230 veto qui ont été votés au Conseil de sécurité. Vous avez un seul exemple... Où les fondamentalement un seul exemple où les mécanismes de sécurité collective ont bien marché, c'est la première guerre du Golfe en 1990. Que là, qu'à cette date, pas vraiment avant et pas du tout après. Pourquoi Deux phrases, s'il vous plaît, cher Hugo Flavier. Parce que le droit international est certain droit. Moi, je pense que c'est un droit. Il a des sources, il a des normes bien précises, je viens de le dire, mais il a un certain problème. Parce qu'effectivement, il se déroule dans une scène anarchique, pas forcément au sens de chaos et de désordre de chien lit, comme dirait De Gaulle, mais dans le sens étymologique d'absence d'autorité centrale, de gouvernement central. Qu'est-ce qu'on dit à Aron Raymond Aron, pour rester un peu dans les auteurs français, à cause de cette, cette, cet aspect des, des, enfin, de cette caractéristique décentralisatrice ou enfin, de son caractère de, 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 de droit décentralisé, euh, Aron dit. Et je termine. Le droit international demeure marqué d'une imperfection essentielle, faute d'une instance habilitée à l'interpréter, donc d'un juge, et faute d'une force irrésistible au service de la loi, donc d'une police mondiale. Chaque État se réserve en fait le droit de se faire justice lui-même, comme dans des temps primitifs. Alors, à partir de là, certains auteurs théoriciens du droit font des lectures différentes. Koyev, Alexandre Koyev, pense qu'il n'y a pas de droit, enfin si, mais que le droit international n'a pas de caractère juridique parce qu'il n'y a pas le fameux tiers-arbitre parmi deux parties qui s'opposent. Kelsen, au contraire, pense que oui, c'est un système décentralisé, mais qu'il suffit d'avoir des sanctions, et il voit ces sanctions dans les représailles et la guerre, et donc ça suffit pour donner un caractère juridique à ce droit décentralisé. Mais cette définition théorique, finalement, n'est pas mon propos. Mon propos, c'est de vous dire, cette crise fondamentalement est géopolitique, même si le droit existe, mais ne comptez pas sur le droit international pour la régler. Alors, mais quelle est alors la force du droit international mais Il y a quand même un aspect, alors, on rend les fonctions du droit international, un aspect de socialisation et de légitimation. N'oubliez pas que les Russes, comme les Américains en 1999, ont tenté de légitimer leur action politique, qui est de la pure power politics, politique de puissance, par des arguments juridiques. Alors faux, faible, ténu, comme vous voulez, mais par des arguments juridiques. Si le droit international n'avait aucune force, personne ne se donnera la peine d'essayer de, d'argumenter sur le terrain du droit. On ferait comme les Athéniens dans le dialogue de Mélos, on dirait « bon, on est les plus forts, on fait ce qu'on veut ». Parfois c'est plus honnête, je, je l'admets. Enfin, 2500 ans se sont écoulés, 2400 et quelques, bon, c'est peut-être pas plus mal qu'on essaie au moins de, de justifier notre, nos, nos attitudes par rapport au droit. Voilà, il y aurait beaucoup de choses à dire, mais j'en termine là. Merci beaucoup Hugo pour ce petit dépassement de temps. Voilà, il a déjà Merci. coupé, voilà, il était député. Merci encore une fois pour votre attention. Merci beaucoup, monsieur le professeur. Merci, cher Miloche, pour, pour toutes ces observations.
ces réflexions euh, qui, qui rendent le droit, le, le droit vivant, hein, euh, qui, 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 fait, qui part du droit aussi comme étant une expérience juridique. Hein. On ne vit pas la, le droit international selon où l'on est, si l'on est bourreau ou victime, tu as dit. Euh, alors après, euh, il faut avoir conscience d'être bourreau ou conscience d'être victime, ce n'est pas forcément évident. Si je peux me permettre. Sauf que, sauf que la conscience d'être victime est assez simple, oui, c'est oui. dans la chair. La conscience d'être bourreau voilà, est, est très compliquée. Parce que c'est des grandes puissances et les grandes puissances ne regardent pas les, ceux qui ne sont pas des grandes puissances. Donc voilà, c'est un, un peu ce que, ce, que, ce que je voulais dire. Et, euh, et, et les contradictions aussi, parfois les contradictions occidentales, euh, mais les contradictions de tout le monde, les contradictions occidentales, les contradictions russes aussi, hein, puisque l'argumentaire russe sur le, sur le, le Kosovo, qu'elle qu réutilise, ne réutilise pas à l'égard de la Crimée, où elle est elle aussi, en réalité, euh, en situation euh, de porte-à-faux, euh, tout comme les Occidentaux, où tout le monde est en réalité euh, en situation de, de porte-à-faux, et pour terminer par des éléments un petit peu de théorie du droit, où la boucle est bouclée avec, avec euh, euh, notre collègue euh, Jovanovic aussi, euh, sur une réflexion sur les fonctions légitimantes du, 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 la fonction légitimante du droit international National. Donc, cela permet de donner euh, de l'ampleur encore plus à cette, à cette conférence et, euh, et, et j'espère à, à, à la réflexion. Donc, le, le, temps, le, temps de la réfle le temps des questions euh, est ouvert et euh, nous sommes donc euh, heureux d'accueillir de, de, de vos questions. Alors, il y en a une là, une là, il y en a beaucoup. Euh, on va prendre, on va prendre trois, trois questions par trois questions, enfin trois personnes. Ah, on va faire ça. En, fait, en fait, cher Hugo, j'en ai une question pour chaque intervenant. Euh, première question pour euh, M. Branko Rakic. C'était très intéressant de vous écouter, mais je n'ai pas compris jusqu'à la fin. Cela veut dire que je voudrais que vous concrétisiez. Donc, euh, j'ai compris qu'une promesse publique, elle engage. Voilà. Mais euh, dans le cas de cette promesse de l'OTAN envers la Russie, est-ce que je n'ai pas, com pas compris jusqu'à la fin La promesse, elle a été faite elle a été faite publique ou elle a été faite seulement dans le contexte de l'Allemagne, de la réunification de l'Allemagne Je voudrais que vous concrétisez ici. Je voudrais donner une question à notre ami Tanassier. Si vous voulez concrétiser voilà, sur le droit de l'autodétermination du peuple, est-ce qu'il y a une différence ou comment il faut juger de l'autodétermination du peuple ou de la population du certain territoire voilà, parce qu'ici, pour moi, ce n'est pas jusqu'à la fin que euh, je voudrais des concrétisations. Et j'ai une question aussi assez courte pour notre collègue Miloš. Euh, Miloš, euh, tout le monde connaît, j'en suis sûr, sur le pacte Brian Kellogg de 1928. Moi, euh, je cite l'article 1, l'article 2 pour tout le monde. Donc, les autres parties contractantes déclarent solennellement au nom de leur peuple respectif qu'elles condamnent le recours à la guerre pour le règlement des différents internationaux et renoncent en tant qu'instrument des politiques nationales de leurs relations mutuelles. Oui, voilà, le deuxième article est aussi, aussi très pertinent. Ma question, c'est un pacte qui date de 1928. Vous le trouvez maintenant en vigueur, applicable, aussi pertinent pour notre discussion où vous le trouvez déjà dépassé par le temps Parce qu'il y en a presque 100 ans. Voilà, merci. Alors, euh, vous, euh, voilà, vous aviez levé la main d'abord. Après, vous, après vous, la, la, la collègue, la, la, la jeune femme, la demoiselle, voilà, allez-y. Et ensuite, le, le professeur Begovic. Et après vous, voilà, vous y allez. I have questions for professors Marinkovic and Rakic. Uh, the International Court of Justice stated that declarations of independence are not in themselves in violation of international law unless they are the result of an unlawful use of force by a third party. Uh, many claim that this was the case in Crimea because of uh, the Russian military presence there, even though their uh, takeover was bloodless. On the other hand, the same is not recognized in the case of Kosovo, even though it's uh, obvious that the only reason why why they were in a position to make that to 
Uh, the same is not recognized in the case of Kosovo, even though it's obvious that the only reason why they were in a position to make that declaration was the NATO aggression in 1999, even though it was a bit remote in time. So that's my question for you. On the other hand, for Professor Rakic, uh, what would you say uh, why Ukrainian leaders uh, so vehemently dismiss uh, neutrality as their security strategy, even though even Western diplomats like Kissinger uh, claim that uh, Ukraine can be a functional country only if it is the bridge between the East and West. So these are my questions. Thank you. Another, which was no, somewhere, yeah, three, three people. I don't know if you want over there. Okay. Uh. Thank you. I also have two questions which relate mostly to the presentations by Professor Rakic and Tanasie, but I hope Milos might also be inspired to answer because he has a specific point of view, so maybe his opinion will differ from theirs. Regarding uh, Professor Rakic, uh, regarding your presentation, what do you think should be the consequences if we accept that the promise was binding and that any further expansion of NATO was in fact illegal? So should we consider any further acts as legally non-existent and countries who have access later as in fact not having become uh, legally valid members of the NATO. Should non-NATO members impose sanctions on NATO countries due to this breach? And do you actually think any of, maybe not these, but any measures that you might find uh, justifiable, do you think any of them would be practically applicable? A question regarding Kosovo and Crimea uh, for Tanasi and anyone else who might feel inspired. Now, of course, this is a complicated subject. Personally, I prefer to interpret the Russian references to the case of Kosovo as more of pointing out to the Western parties, look at what you did accept, what you do consider legal, how can you not consider the Crimea case legal? Then again, maybe I'm an optimist, maybe I'm reading into the statements what I would like to see there, but it seems to me that in many contexts that when those statements were given, that was sort of the underlining. And being a legal historian, I do like going a bit back into the past, I don't think 10 years is much of a time frame that can be considered a long one in this context, what, what the colleague said, that the, the difference between the NATO aggression and uh, the proclamation of Kosovo's independence, but I'd like to go a few uh, steps further back to the past. Sorry if I'm overextending it, I'll try to be brief. Uh, some time after uh, Crimea joined Russia, however you choose to qualify that, we had a Russian professor here as a guest on an unrelated subject, and someone asked him, well, how can you do that with Crimea? What about our Kosovo and so on? And he answered, you don't understand, Crimea is our Kosovo. And of course, not literally. There are many things that are different, both legally and historically, but there is a point of semblance there. Crimea had been a part of Russia for several centuries. The population there mostly saw itself as Russian, and uh, its belonging to Ukraine was seen by many as an aberration, and now the return to Crimea, of Crimea to Russia uh, can be seen as a sort of restoration of what used to be rightfully theirs. While in the case of Kosovo, we have the situation, whatever you might think of how broad the right to secession should be interpreted in the context of international laws, uh, specific constitutions, etc. But even if all other factors were not present, in the case of Kosovo, we have the situation where the Albanian population, which is now the majority population in the province, uh, has forcefully expelled thousands and thousands of 
Serbian citizens of Serbian ethnicity in order to create that majority. In such a situation, even if all other uh, conditions for a legal referendum were present, could you consider the results of such a referendum as legal and legitimate? Personally, I think not, but I would like to hear your opinions on both accounts and sorry for taking up the time. Sorry? Uh, I meant the if there was, I meant just the the in, in the so-called independence of Kosovo. I don't mean it, if it went further to join Albania. So the first question is uh, uh, whether uh, there was, uh, uh, it concerned only the, the expansion on, on the territory of East Germany or uh, uh, the whole. I uh, made a quotation already, for instance, I will, I will may, remake uh, two now. Uh, uh, the the Genscher Baker pre press conference after their meeting, 2nd February 19. Nine, 2nd February 1990, the, 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 the Genscher, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Germany, and uh, Jens Baker, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the United States of America. So they're standing, standing together. Now Genscher speaks for both of them. Uh, and uh, uh, he says, perhaps I might add, uh, we were in full agreement that there is uh, no intention to extend the NATO area of defense and the security towards the East. This holds true not only for Gen German Democratic Republic, uh, which we have no intention to simply co incorporating, but that holds true for all the other Eastern countries. And uh, uh, there is, he also repeated once again, uh, we, ba Baker and me, uh, uh, agreed that the intention does not exist to, uh, to extend the NATO defense area towards the East. This applies, uh, moreover, not just to the territory of the, the German Democratic Republic, uh, but rather applies in general, or in German, because he was speaking German, das gilt ganz uh, generell. So that this is, okay, the Baker, the, the Baker Gorbachev meeting, and uh, I also made the quotation, and I now, no, no, uh, Baker asks to, uh, to, to, uh, to Gorbachev, uh, I want to ask you a question, and you need no, uh, not answer it right now. Supposing unification takes place, what would you prefer? A unit, a united Germany outside NATO, absolutely independent and without uh, uh, American troops, or united Germany keeping a connection with, in, uh, uh, with NATO, but with the guarantees that NATO uh, jurisdiction or troops will not spread east uh, uh, of the uh, present boundary. Uh, and uh, uh, Gorbachev, it goes without saying that the broadening of the NATO zone uh, is not acceptable. And uh, uh, Baker says we agree with that. It also it is clear that he means broadening, uh, speaking, generally speaking. And also there is after the, the next day there is a meeting between Genscher and uh, uh, Gorbachev. Uh, uh, who repeats what he said at the, at, the, at, the, at the press conference. You can find that uh, on uh, National Security Archive. That is the American uh, official website. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so those... Uh... Yeah, okay. There are, there are some others who still see, yeah, okay. That, that, that's... That, that, okay. Uh, 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 so that, that, that's it. And uh, the, as the, the International Court of Justice said, so uh, unilateral declaration, even without uh, any, any, uh, 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 any, 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 any uh, demand uh, uh, in, uh, from the other side. And here it is not even unilateral because uh, this is uh, the, the Russians agreed uh, to that. Uh, uh, to, the, to the German re re reunification, and the condition was uh, don't spread uh, NATO towards this because it is a danger for us. It is uh, you bring uh, nuclear weapons to close to our border. We have the case uh, in 1962, and it is similar. The the, the United States, the United uh, States of America first uh, planted uh, uh, their, their missiles. Uh, 
Jupiter in Italy and in Turkey. Then in response to that and in response to the intervention in the uh, Bay of Pigs, uh, uh, the Russians uh, started installing their, 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 their facilities for uh, nuclear uh, missiles in Cuba. And then there was a, a strong reaction on the American side. And finally, they, 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 they decided uh, the Russians not to put their missiles in uh, Cuba. And uh, the Americans brought back their missiles from uh, Turkey. So that is, uh, that is not uh, the, the first time. There are other situations, for instance, when, when such, such unilateral declarations also, for instance, like uh, 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 the possibility of uh, Westerners to go to Berlin during the, the existence of Eastern Germany, that was uh, not uh, part of any document. It was unilateral declaration from Soviet side. So it is in international law, that's, that, that's normal. You cannot expect everything to be written. And especially, you do not get the guarantee from anybody. It's heads of states, ministers of foreign affairs, heads of governments. So it has a strength and a, and a, and a weight. That, so. OK. So that's it. Uh, should I answer to the other? Uh, or, yeah, yeah, go uh, answer, answer to, answer to all the questions. Uh, okay. I'll address to you, and after it's uh, yeah. uh, So, Sanya, I think, uh, asked about. Uh, uh, me personally, I agree with uh, with Kissinger. It, it would be better to, you know, there is one principle. There is something which uh, exists in international law in the in the in the practice of the United Nations. Uh, so that's the, the disarmament, uh, uh, spre spreading, expanding uh, NATO or any kind of alliance uh, uh, is uh, just goes uh, to the opposite direction. So it is not disarmament. It is uh, it's it's arming. Uh, 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 additionally, uh, some states, and I think it was it was, uh, uh, and the Russians even in December la last year uh, uh, proposed a kind of an arrangement of uh, 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 keeping uh, Ukraine neutral, and uh, I think that 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 would be, and not me myself. I, I uh, uh, made a quotation of what. Uh, George Kennan says, or what, uh, for instance, Professor Mearsheimer says. So, so the, the leading experts uh, from the United States uh, say that. And what is the most important? The uh, Ukrainian population was for something like that. You can look at the elections in Ukraine. Uh, after the first elections, okay, that, that was at the, at the moment of uh, just before the dissolution, it was, uh, it was structured. The, in 1994, it was, it was uh, 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 what is the name? Uh, the, 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 the president uh, of, uh, of Ukraine was uh, uh, Kuchma, yeah, Leonid Kuchma, uh, was uh, uh, considered to be for good relations with Russia. Then in the, uh, he, uh, he was president twice. Then in 2004, there, is, there are elections in which Yanukovych, the, the president of the, of the, of the uh, party of the regions, who wins. And then after that, uh, he's also for good relations with Russia. There is the, the, the Orange Revolution. Then in 2010, it is again, again Yanukovych who, who, uh, who wins at, at the election. And most of the time also at the, at the parliamentary, uh, there are changes uh, in parliamentary elections, but uh, also those uh, uh, who are for good relations with Russia. So the, the, the Ukrainian pop population was uh, for it, it's not. Uh, it's not uh, something which was uh, against, which would be against the will of uh, Ukrainian Ukrainian population. And I think it would be. It would. It would have been good. Unfortunately, now what we have is uh, a disaster. So, so that, that's it. And what was the the third question? Well, unfortunately, as as, as Milos said, uh, we are now we have. Uh, 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 that is international law. So if there is a binding uh, uh, act, uh, uh, there is no sanction after, after, after that. So that is the problem in, in international law. Uh, usually some sanction may, may exist uh, in uh, uh, organized uh, groups like, uh, I don't know, or some, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, United Nations, there are some sanctions, but this is, wouldn't include that. And uh, uh, so there is uh, practically nothing, except uh, that uh, uh, the Russian side could uh, invoke that in the situations that uh, when something is reproached to them, which they do. So that is, unfortunately, international law is uh, not perfect. And some even say that it is not law. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> but, 
Okay, that, 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 that's it. Okay, Vladimir, uh, so um, actually that's one of the big issues in uh, when it comes to the external aspect of the right to self-determination. Who is the, uh, who has the title and what should be the procedure like? So how it should be achieved? And uh, what is, uh, what is undisputed is that when we speak of, uh, of those first two categories where it is clearly recognized and those are uh, as, as they were called at that time, dependent people or colonized people, that it's the whole nation which enjoys that right. And on the other side, it also goes for the occupied uh, people. Um, however, the, the, uh, the third category, the, uh, the one uh, which concerns, which is uh, uh, exposed to a severe, um, uh, massive injustices on the basis of its um, religion or um, or race um, there we speak of minorities i mean it is generally considered as minorities that the minorities uh, could raise that that argument um, but at the same time and to, to relate that question to the question of procedure when we look in the in the comparative law and we look how for example the uh, referendums were or referenda were organized in switzerland for the separation of uh, uh, Jura de Bern uh, from the canton of Bern, uh, or when we look at the advisory opinion of the of the um, uh, Supreme Court of Canada, we see that actually that process is quite uh, uh, is more inclusive than that. And for example, in case of uh, in case of uh, 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 separation of uh, creation of a separate canton of Jura, uh, there were four referenda which were organized. It was a cascade of, a cascade of referenda uh, in order to enable a minority within the minority which wants to secede uh, to be able to express itself and to stay with the previous majority if it wants and there we speak of the creation of a new canton and not uh, of a secession uh, creation of a new state um, I'm, I'm giving these two examples deliberately as examples of well-established democracies to see how it it uh, it works and how maybe it should work for the international law if we are uh, going with that uh, uh, you know if we're, if we're expanding that right or the the the, uh, the supreme court of canada insists on the on the on an inclusive dialogue uh, with uh, uh, if, if it is the case of the province of quebec to have it with the anglophones but also to have it with indigenous populations uh, such as Inuits or um, or, uh, or Indians, um, uh, before addressing that issue um, uh, 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 on a on a national level. Uh, so it, it's it's as I said, it's an undefined right uh, in many in many aspects. Um, Sanya, when it comes to your question, actually, if if I remember well, the the in the advisory opinion, the uh, the International Court of Justice reformulated the question. This was the question which it took and decided to answer. The question was whether there was a right to secession in international law. And then the court said, um, yeah, uh, the, uh, but, but it, ho yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not uh, using maybe terminology. Yes, but whether it was in line with international law, but they, they reformulated and put it, uh, whether it is prohibited in international law a unilateral contrary secession. Contrary to sorry. Contrary. Whether it's contrary. Sorry, sorry. Whether it's contrary to. The court. Whether it is contrary. Um, so yeah, that's right. It's it's much much uh, it's much too strong prohibit. Whether it is contrary to, um, and um, so uh, it looks. And then uh, was it James Crawford who, uh, before the before himself said uh, Western Australia said now I declare the independence of the Western Australia to show that. Uh, Actually, nothing is going to happen. It's not uh, here in the presence of the judges. I say that Western Australia is an independent uh, state. Um, so um, uh, in, in terms of international law, uh, there is no, uh, uh, there, there, are, there, are, uh, there are evidences that, there were, there were, there were, there were, that Russian forces were present in Crimea uh, at the, at the, uh, uh, while the election was held. Uh, uh, on the 16th of, uh, of March 2014, even there are some, I, I, this is what I read, that, that, uh, that uh, um, members of, this, of the assembly of Crimea 
uh, were in a in a sort in a way locked in that room when they were deciding on the when they were de taking decision to organize the uh, that referendum. Um, so that 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 referendum that secession was not uh, uh, could not be qualified as a as a right to external self determination under international law. Yes, and the Hairston, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I even, uh, I don't consider them to be referenda at all. And even less, even less, this is why I said, compared to Nina's PowerPoint, mine is not a PowerPoint. So that is a PowerPoint, you know, Jura is a referendum and not this one. Um, so uh, the same goes with Kosovo. Uh, it was uh, there was no uh, authorization of the under Article 41 of the Charter. The authorization is to Security Council to to intervene. Uh, that cannot be qualified as a as a as an external self determination in terms of international law. Um, Nina, I think the comparison is really uh, unacceptable. <laughs> I mean, Kosovo is much um, heavier in terms of its emotional um, force in our culture and history, you know. So, I mean, but, but, but I think that that colleague really abused, <laughs> you know, abused our feelings about Kosovo because our modern state was based on the Kosovo myth and the uh, um, uh, uh, values uh, which were uh, spread through the, uh, 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 through the through the through the through the folk songs, you know, and through uh, so um, the it's it's uh, it's very much part it's much more part of our um, ethnic identity uh, than uh, compared to Crimea's uh, uh, place in uh, in the in the hearts of uh, uh, it was for one period of time. But you know, when you look at the Austro-Hungarian Empire, where it was, and when we start thinking in those terms, there is no limit to that logic. Uh, 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 the, uh, so, so, so I, uh, I, uh, I, I, again, I don't think that that comparison was uh, was appropriate. Yeah. What was just your mind? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I agree with you. Yes, we no, had, no. We had a forced expansion of Tatar population by Soviet government. So, yeah. They, it also changed the demographic situation in Crimea as it did the Serbs in Kosovo. Yeah, I no, I, I, I think if we. Keep the same standard. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. No, no, I mean. Uh, um, I, under international law, majority, I don't majority. see a way to legitimize yeah, even that action with a referendum. You know. So, uh, and if uh, if we are considering uh, what 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 would make that referendum legitimate, I think it would have to be organized in a in a um, in this uh, Swiss way as a cascade referendum. And it was proposed actually at one point in our. To remind ourselves of it, uh, and Dragoli Popovic, who is speaking right now, was uh, uh, was actually a member of that uh, group of constitutional experts who suggested in 1997 that there should be that kind of cascade referendum for Kosovo at that time, headed by by Lydia Bastafliner. So that group, where you suggested, you know, in 1990, it was in 1997 that uh, the, the proposals for the, the cascade yes, cascade yeah. referendum. Yes. So um, I think uh, if we were we are to consider the a referendum as a as a sort of uh, as a some kind of solution for um, um, uh, for Kosovo, then uh, uh, definitely has to be well taught, well taught, and uh, I agree with you that the population which was expelled should be allowed to not only even before they return to vote in that referendum. I agree with you. Uh, if I may briefly, nothing can qualify for an external secession. Once again, nothing. There is no situation that can qualify for external secession since it doesn't exist in international positive law. Period. End of story. And on the legal ground, strictly speaking, you can compare the situation in Kosovo and Crimea. 
Most of North Crimea cannot secede from their states. Period, once again. On strictly legal ground. No, no, for, forget referendums. No. From the aspect of international law, you don't have the right to secede from a state. Unless, but it's not secession anymore, if the state agrees to give you, to grant you independence. And I will, I will, I will continue in French, sorry. It will be much easier for me and for you, maybe. Well, I'm sorry. I'm speaking, so you know, I'm thinking of myself that that's the Western egoism and individualism. So, il y a une raison à ça. Il y a une raison à ça. C'est-à-dire, le droit international, qui est principalement créé par les États, ne va pas produire une norme de droit qui va tuer ces États. C'est logique. Deuxième chose. Deuxième chose, mais vous créerez une instabilité juridique internationale sans précédent. C'est-à-dire que chaque fois qu'il y a un changement démographique, ça peut se faire sur 30 ans, au Kosovo ça s'est fait sur 30 ans quasiment, de 1 à 2,5 à 1 à 7,5, serbe albanais. À chaque fois qu'il y a un changement démographique, on peut créer un nouvel État. Donc c'est impossible. Troisième line of argument, if you prefer. Aujourd'hui on parle de minorité ethnique. Mais dans le monde actuel, pourquoi pas parler, et ça se fera, demain, de minorités, orientation sexuelle, minorité, je ne sais quoi, qui pourront, si elles sont homogènes dans un quartier, dans une ville, dans une dans, dans un, dans partie d'un territoire, demander la sécession. Je caricature à peine. C'est dans l'ordre du possible. Donc, non. Alors, peut-être je vous ai surpris par ma position sur la Russie, vous connaissez ma position politique sur la Russie. Bon. Mais là, on est sur, des, sur un plan strictement juridique. On peut, de ce fait, comparer toutes les situations sécessionnistes. Après, il est vrai que la pratique a une approche tout à fait incohérente de toutes ces situations. Et les États, pareillement. Moi, j'ai cité Marcel et Cohen en parlant de, 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 des Occidentaux, qui disent « bon, le Kosovo, ça peut partir, on ne sait pas pourquoi ». On sait, « power politics ». Mais la Crimée ne peut pas, parce qu'on sait aussi, « power politics ». Mais les Russes aussi ont leurs contradictions. Parce que ce que je dis, ça vaut pour la Tchétchénie aussi. Et ça a été dit par les Occidentaux, alors pas aux Nations Unies, mais, mais j'ai des, voilà, ici des, 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 des déclarations des officiels occidentaux, français, euh, allemands, britanniques, qui disent non, le principe d'intégrité territoriale joue pour la Russie aussi. Et les Tchétchènes ne peuvent pas faire, enfin la Tchétchénie ne peut pas faire sécession. Alors c'est soit l'un, soit l'autre. Après, je disais, le droit international, c'est juste un registre de, de, de légitimation de notre question. À la fin, ça se réglera par les armes. Et là, alors, ça, ça peut être décevant, ça peut être bon. C'est comme ça. Ça a toujours été comme ça. Avant de répondre à votre question, justement, puisque j'y viens, une dernière preuve qu'il n'y a pas d'autodétermination externe, à ma connaissance, et là j'utilise James Crawford, précité euh, par Tanassi Malenkovitch, aucun État n'a accédé, accédé à une pleine indépendance sans avoir été au préalable reconnu par l'État duquel il a fait sécession. C'est pour ça qu'on demande tant à la Serbie de reconnaître le Kosovo. Parce que tant que ce n'est pas fait, rien n'est fait. Il faut savoir ça. Et c'est la preuve ultime qu'il n'y a pas d'autodétermination externe en droit international. Avant de vous répondre, alors je, je réponds à des questions qui ne m'ont pas été posées. Alors peut-être qu'on peut attendre, parce qu'elles vont être non, posées je, je, dans je, la je, prochaine non, je, série des questions. Non, non, sur, sur la ICG Advisory Opinion, on en fait un grand cas. Les juges n'ont rien dit dans cette opinion, enfin dans, cette, dans cet avis consultatif. Taras Amalinkovic a raison d'insister sur ce qu'a dit en jouant un peu James Crawford, qui était conseil de la partie albanaise, Kosova, enfin Pristina. Il a dit « Moi, je suis South Australia. Ici, je déclare l'indépendance de l'Australie du Sud. Est-ce que j'ai enfreint le droit international ?» Non. Pourquoi Parce que le droit international ne s'occupe absolument pas des déclarations unilatérales d'indépendance. La question, ce n'est pas est-ce que la sécession est conforme au droit international, est-ce qu'une déclaration est conforme C'était ça la grande différence. Nous, maintenant, ici, on déclare l'indépendance de la municipalité de parler le droit. Si je ne me trompe pas, on aime bien parler le droit. Le droit international s'en fiche éperdument. Il ne règle pas, il ne régit pas ses, ses affaires. Donc, on en fait un cas de cette advisory opinion. Il n'a pas lieu d'être. C'est choquant ce qu'ils ont dit par ailleurs. Ça. Le résultat final n'est pas choquant, il est politiquement dommageable pour la Serbie. Juridiquement, ils ne disent rien sur le fond. 
D'ailleurs, juridiquement, ils disent une bonne chose sur le fond. Selon la résolution 1244 et le régime qu'elle instaure, toute action unilatérale est illégale. Sauf qu'ils n'ont pas jugé que ces déclarations a été le produit des institutions provisoires pays mais que c'était en fait un groupe indéfini de personnes qui se sont réunies dans les locaux de ces institutions, qui sont en place parce qu'ils ont été élus par les gens pour être ces officiels. Ils portent les noms et prénoms de ces officiels, ils ont la même apparence physique, mais en fait ils se sont présentés dans la déclaration « We the people of Kosovo ». Et donc les juges disent, dans un raisonnement scandaleux, juridiquement, logiquement scandaleux, mais vraiment c'est un scandale sans pareil, ils disent ben non, c'est pas eux, ça c'est pas Slobodan Saramadjic, parce qu'il dit que c'est pas Slobodan Saramadjic, ça c'est pas Miloš Jornic, parce que lui-même il dit que c'est pas Miloš Jornic, ça c'est pas Hugo, parce qu'il dit que c'est pas Hugo, peu importe qu'il a une carte d'identité, qu'il a la tête d'Hugo, que moi j'ai, non, non, c'était honteux. D'ailleurs, lisez les, les, les avis enfin, dissidents de Benona, de Tomka. En fait, ce qu'a ce qu fait le tribunal, il a dit, bon, c'est pas des voleurs, parce qu'eux-mêmes disent que ce ne sont pas des voleurs. De Scandaleux comme avis consultatif. Mais juridiquement, il n'y a aucun mal pour la Serbie. Et juridiquement, ils n'ont rien dit de neuf sur le droit international par rapport au droit à l'autodétermination. Il n'y a rien dans cet avis. Sauf, je l'admets, terre intégrité territoriale, ils le disent, c'est un principe interétatique directement lié à une menace externe. Ça ne protège pas les États de mouvement de sécession. Bon. Et je, je termine avec, avec vous. Vous m'avez bien compris. Enfin, peut-être non, parce que vous me posez la question, donc c'est moi qui me suis mal exprimé. Oui, le pacte de 1928 est très important. La SDN, c'est très important. La charte, c'est très important. Je l'ai chez moi, j'ai plusieurs exemplaires. J'y crois. Enfin, j'y crois. Je crois que c'est une évolution plus que souhaitable de ce monde. Et ça évolue lentement. C'est pour ça que j'ai dit, en 1914, il n'y avait pas de « use at bell dans », dans le sens où c'était prohibé. On pouvait légitimement et légalement recourir à la force dans les relations internationales. Aujourd'hui, du moins, on ne peut pas le faire légalement. Est-ce que pour autant, on s'arrête de le faire Non, et on le fera encore. Mais laisser à l'humanité encore, je ne sais pas, 50, 100 ans, j'espère qu'on y viendra. C'est un, une légère différence, mais c'est une différence qu'il faut savoir cultiver, et c'est pour ça, et je termine vraiment avec ça, j'ai eu une idée il y a des, des années, après une conférence avec Mio Dagobana, mais justement de faire un article sur le droit international en disant que les pires ennemis du droit international sont les professeurs de droit international, les juristes internationaux. Je préfère qu'on dise « c'est contre le droit », qu'on essaye souvent vainement de justifier de la politique de puissance. Ce que les juristes occidentaux ont fait pendant la crise yougoslave et l'agression contre mon pays est pareillement scandaleux. Ce que la Cour internationale de justice a fait avec l'affaire de Srebrenica, avec l'avis consultatif sur le Kosovo, est proprement scandaleux. C'est le droit pas au service de la justice, c'est le droit au service de la politique des puissants. Il faut que ça s'arrête. C'est pour ça que je crois au droit, mais ça prendra du temps. Et ça demande une certaine, un certain équilibre international. Au final, le droit international est toujours tributaire, je ne vais pas dire victime, tributaire des rapports de force internationaux. Plus il y a d'équilibre, mieux le droit se poste, porte, même si après il est supplanté par, par l'équipe des puissances, mais peu importe. Merci, si Merci beaucoup, euh, Miloche. Alors, nous allons passer à une nouvelle série de questions. Il y avait euh, une là, professeur Begovic, vous voulez poser des questions, non Non Ah, yes, oh, you wanted to... yes. Euh, là-bas, et ensuite... Euh, ouais. Ah, you, you, you want to speak at the end, at the very end? No. <laughs> yeah, the microphone, please. And uh... oh, this one is working. Hey, Professor, yeah, yeah, this one is working. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, well, two things. One is, is, is follow up on Milos, but not this your reaction, but the previous, the first one. This is, this is about uh, something that I would uh, label as historical responsibility for war in Ukraine. And I do believe that historical responsibility is not on Russia only. This is aggression by Russia, but I don't believe that historical responsibility is national. And I think that uh, what is needed 
is a careful, thorough examination of international relations since the end of the Cold War from 1989, from 1989 till the NATO expansion to the East was not straightforward. Uh, it was controversial even for Americans. And I think that we should uh, understand what happened and why that happened. I think that there was a missed opportunity. That missed opportunity was partnership for peace. And this was an American program back in 1995. And this, this program was done. Instead of partnership for peace, there was a NATO expansion, which uh, led to pushing the line to the east. <coughs> and this contributed to the situation in which this aggression started. So that is one thing, and I completely agree with the suggestion that this topic deserves a special conference, uh, either this place or some other place. Now, about some of the insights Professor Rakic shared with us. As you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't comment on the statement that um, uh, politicians giving their statements at the press conferences create legal obligations. That is something that I leave to the lawyers. But, and I just imagine if that is the case, just imagine public life in Serbia with uh, President of Serbia giving every day uh, a press conference with uh, statements contradicting the statements from the previous uh, day. So it would be, I think, anarchy is the right way for that. However, uh, is historiograph uh, from the historiographical point of view, I don't think that politicians are reliable witnesses. Especially not in hindsight. Mr. Gorbachev gave two different accounts with substantial self interest in bringing these accounts uh, to what happened, and that is that was not his fault. Uh, so, the only, to me, the only relevant source for the pledge, or rather the lack of it, is actually archived. And uh, in these archives, there is only one sentence about one inch. And that sentence is a hypothetical question given by State Department Chief James Baker in Moscow on the 8th of February, uh, 1990. However, instead of going through all these things. What is the bottom line? This the agreement. <clears throat> this is the agreement known as 2 plus, four, uh, 2 plus 4. This is the treaty on the final settlement with respect to Germany. And in that treaty, signed by four powers, great powers, and one emerging power, at that time still two countries, there was absolutely no assurances whatsoever about NATO expansion further to the east. There was about, it was only about Germany. Well, the title of it is a treaty on the final settlement uh, with respect to Germany. Now, one could ask a question whether this was good for Russia or good for Soviet Union. Uh, one could ask the question, uh, taking into account that before this agreement there was a strong leverage and that strong leverage was 400,000 Russian soldiers in Eastern Europe with the legal ground to be there. So basically this agreement signed by Russian officials 
removed that leverage from Russian hands because the troops were eventually uh, removed in 1994, even six months before the deadline. Now, why that happened? Well, there are lots of evidence uh, of inept Russian political, Soviet slash Russian political elite of the time. There was a chaos in that country, a chaos of the chaos of ending the era, ending the communism. But I will end just with a remark by Solzhenitsyn. It was Solzhenitsyn was mentioned this morning uh, uh, by uh, participants from Russia, was Mr. Gunik. And I would refer to Solzhenitsyn's contribution, Red Wheel which was about 1917, about the February Revolution, that the new liberal elite of Russia, after the end of monarchy, thought that it is enough that they are liberal. And because they are liberal, they will be greeted honestly by all sides and everything will be okay. In an interview given close to the end of his life, Solzhenitsyn compared Russian 1917 liberal political elite with a liberal political elite of Soviet Union and uh, Russia in. That's it for the moment. I consider for, this as a question for you. Yeah, for the, for the, for, yeah we, we take uh, several questions. And if you may ask question on our commentary uh, a little bit shorter, because uh, we have already 45 minutes, we are late, only for 45 minutes, so, uh, so, so bien I can understand bien entendu, very quickly. Monsieur le, okay. le président. <laughs> Quatre points très pour que tout le monde puisse s'exprimer. Oui, Quatre okay. points très rapides. D'abord, vous remerciez, vous, les deux universités, pour ce débat que je trouve remarquable. Je n'ai pas pu être là ce matin, mais vraiment, la qualité est indéniable. Je crois que l'Institut français et toutes les, les organisations peuvent être félicitées. Quatre points très rapides. Concernant la première intervention du professeur Rakic, euh, J'ai quand même un petit peu de mal à, à comprendre la logique de savoir s'il y avait eu une promesse ou pas de promesse, euh, sachant que bon, l'expansion de l'OTAN a été volontaire de la part d'États souverains qui voulaient rentrer dans, dans l'OTAN, qui voulaient avoir une protection vu leurs conditions historiques, etc. Et qu'en aucun cas, il avait été mentionné par les membres, certains membres de l'OTAN, et je pense à la France, je pense à l'Allemagne ou autre, que l'Ukraine deviendrait un jour membre de l'OTAN. Donc il n'y avait, avait pas de crainte de ce point de vue-là. Et en tout état de cause, ça ne légitime en aucun cas l'action depuis le 24 février de destruction systématique de l'Ukraine euh, et, et, et des morts que l'on peut considérer. Donc je trouve qu'il y, y a un petit peu euh, une exagération de, de ce point de vue-là à essayer de savoir s'il y avait eu une promesse ou pas. Deuxième euh, point concernant le professeur Marinkovic, euh, j'ai beaucoup aimé le, le, le droit d'ingérence et la référence évidemment aux travaux de Kouchner, Betati et, et compagnie. Une question c'est est-ce que parce qu'il y a eu aussi un bouquin qui s'appelle « Le devoir d'ingérence ». Est-ce que d'un point de vue du droit international, il y a une différence entre le droit d'ingérence et le devoir d'ingérence C'est-à-dire, Est-ce qu'il y a eu des développements euh, jurisprudentiels sur cette euh, question-là euh, Deuxième point sur votre intervention, et c'est bon, je ne pense pas qu'il y ait des, des, des Allemands dans, dans la salle, ou s'il y en a, euh, ils, ils interviendront. Euh, je trouve un petit peu euh, euh, exagéré de parler de nazisme quand on sait ce que c'est que le nazisme. Donc l'argumentation utilisée par certains États de dire qu'éventuellement en Ukraine il y avait des nazis ou que c'est une politique nazie ou autre, quand on sait historiquement ce que c'est que le nazisme avec une extermination systématique de juifs, des millions de morts euh, à une certaine période de notre histoire, ça me semble, la comparaison me semble quelque peu déplacée et le contexte, et on a l'habitude de dire, les Allemands ont l'habitude de dire, ne banalisons pas ce qui s'est passé chez nous. Euh, et donc, ça serait bien que chacun garde ça à l'esprit. Troisième, quatrième point euh, concernant le professeur Jovanovic. Euh, excellente présentation, j'ai beaucoup apprécié et je suis tout à fait d'accord avec votre interprétation juridique. 
Alors, je ne suis plus un académique, mais la question que j'ai et qui peut se poser aux trois intervenants, c'est le droit international, le système international ne fonctionne plus. Bon, ça, ça a été le constat plus ou moins qu'on a, qu a tiré les uns aux autres. Il y, y a des choses qui ne fonctionnent pas, etc. Est-ce que vous auriez chacun un conseil pour améliorer justement ce droit international, ce système international Un conseil précis. Je suis conseiller actuellement. Mon rôle, c'est d'essayer de faire avancer les choses. Et donc, ce que j'aime bien du, point, du, du côté des universitaires, c'est qu'on me donne des idées pour voir si elles sont effectivement applicables pour les mettre en, en pratique. Je vous remercie. On prend d'autres questions. On, prend, on va continuer. Oh, we take another question. So we had two. C'est mieux de répondre une idée, Gaston, parce qu'on oublie ce qu'on veut. Non, 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 non. It's better. Uh, trust me. To 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 hear some questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's the only power. So <laughs> we'll use it and we will listen to. to uh, can I have the, the, the microphone? And, Professor Begovic, yeah. I'm, I'm sure he has two mics. Ah, yes, we had two questions here, and after these two questions, you will answer. Uh, I have one comment uh, concerning the principle of uh, right of self-determination. Uh, well, uh, Tanasia quoted uh, the definition of the issue within the U.S. Charter, U.N. Charter, uh, and I agree with that, that definition. It is uh, I agree with this definition. Definition. It is uh, up to today uh, the most clear, the clearest definition we had. But the, um, um, the explanation um, of the uh, two categories which are consisting in the in this uh, definition uh, that uh, you you gave uh, um, what was us, uh, the, the notion of the people. I agree with your mm -hmm. your interpretation. But what what concerns uh, the, procedure, mm -hmm. which is the other part of the definition and which is pretty back. Mm -hmm. I think that it is a more important issue, mm -hmm. not in terms of uh, the uh, procedure, uh, how would it uh, legally be implemented and so on, but uh, uh, the other uh, kind of question. Uh, uh, it is the, the question, um, uh, uh, who is obliged to define the territory where the on which the secession is supposed to be implemented it is the issue of on, on, on a territory and on a, on a some subject who is uh, who is authorized to, to do that why i am um, insisted on that uh, you uh, mentioned the case of uh, jura in, in switzerland yeah. it is the only case where the uh, issue of territory was the first one they uh, defined the uh, uh, four territories for the referendum, the referenda which took place by the beginning of 70s, uh, last century, one, yeah. if I remember. The first one is the territory of Swiss Confederation. The second one is territory of uh, Canton Bern. The third one is the territory of uh, the region Jura. And the, sec and the fourth one is the territory of a couple of municipalities. So I just uh, uh, speak about uh, with Indra. Mm -hmm. I speak about it because uh, uh, it is it is uh, the standard uh, question when there is confrontation between two principles: principle of territorial integrity of the state and the right of self determination. Well, the 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 answers are pretty different. It depends who is arguing and so on. But this case of Jura. Uh, uh, um, uh, is the uh, uh, how to say illustration uh, of uh, the uh, elder um, older uh, status of the principle of uh, territorial territorial integration in comparison with the right of uh, self, -determ yeah. self determination this is just the, the, the uh, comment on your mm. interpretation of that what concerns uh, uh, the issue of uh, legal value or legal status of uh, of uh, uh, verbal statements in international law in law, in law, in law generally, it is very important the issue regarding the case we are sp uh, speaking about. It is a, it is a case of uh, accord of uh, four plus uh, two and the absence of uh, Soviet intervention regarding the, 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 the demand. 
uh, in sense that uh, some uh, article about the uh, guarantees uh, that uh, NATO would not uh, spread or uh, expand uh, toward the Eastern uh, would be, be uh, put it down. Uh, it is really the fault of Gorbachev and, and the whole uh, political elite of uh, Soviet Union at that time. But there, is, there are really a lot of uh, statements um, of the, the most competent people about this issue. I have a list of 30 statements of uh, uh, high authorities of uh, USA, France, uh, Great Britain, and, and uh, Germany, and, and the adequate uh, uh, foreign relations ministers. And okay, there is a there is a uh, dispute uh, whether it could be the source or it it isn't the source of the international law and so on and so on. But there is some some uh, uh, experience uh, which uh, was taking place uh, uh, simultaneously with, with that uh, discussion during the 90s. Uh, it was a period when the, the countries of uh, Eastern and uh, Central Europe. Uh, uh, had the uh, negotiations on accession and asso uh, association and accession within the European Union. And what is the outcome of that uh, in terms of the issue I'm uh, point, point out? But all 11 countries of uh, Eastern and uh, uh, Central Europe entered to, Na to NATO before they accessing to access to, to the European Union. So it was some uh, tacit, tacit uh, uh, condition for them, uh, parallelly, simultaneously with the formal conditions which have been uh, defined in Copenhagen in terms of economic development, political system, and uh, and uh, legal reform. And uh, well, I am wondering what entering the NATO of that country has to do with the European integration of this country. It is not the issue of European Union, it was the issue of USA. And that's why we, that we uh, today have this conflict. Well, I'm, I'm defining it, with it, it, it is the war between USA and Russia on the ground of Ukraine. And the, the source or, or evolution of that co conflict started much more earlier than we are speaking about the 40, uh, 24 of uh, February or 2014 and, and so on. So that's it. So, no okay. These are only comments. Well, okay. So, so please. Mr. I Professor. have. A, I, I don't. I don't know whether it was a question or. Uh, I, I, I could. I could answer. I mean, it depends on you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because you didn't put it in the form of a question, but as the International Court of Justice <laughs> says. Uh, the form does not matter, so I will keep with. Okay, uh, so uh, you are right. The the, the the two plus four agreement. I think I said that that, that does not uh, uh, mention the extension to uh, to towards expansion towards uh, other uh, uh, Eastern European countries. It deals only with German unification. Even the negotiations that from which I. Uh, quoted uh, the, the past uh, related to other Eastern European countries uh, or press conferences uh, 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 related first and foremost uh, the, the, the German unifications that was the, 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 the chief subject of the object of the of the discussion and then uh, the Russians said okay we agree with German unification but we have some conditions okay uh, uh, Initially, it was uh, the not expansion also was uh, uh, discussed uh, about first uh, the, the question was discussed whether uh, Germany should uh, remain a member of NATO and even the Russians insisted that it remains a member of NATO and Gorbachev said that uh, if it uh, uh, is not a member of NATO, then it might want to develop its own nuclear forces, etc, etc. So it was not a, a good solution for the Russians. So Germany within NATO. So the question was whether uh, inside Germany, NATO troops should be also uh, developed, deployed on the, on the territory of Eastern Germany. It's a little bit uh, complicated to have, a, if you take into account uh, uh, only German army, to, to have parts of the army uh, inside and to, to 
especially because uh, Eastern Germany had its own army, so so they, it, it, it has the right to keep it. And uh, uh, the, the the two plus four agreement uh, even contains uh, uh, the, the article uh, five uh, 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 paragraph three. The last sentence says. Uh, uh, foreign armed forces and nuclear weapons uh, or their carriers will not be stationed in that part of Germany or deployed there. So even in Eastern Germany, there will be no foreign armed forces. So Germany in NATO, that's what the Russians wanted. And But uh, the, the part of the agreement was that there will be no uh, uh, foreign forces on the territory of Eastern Germany. So only Germans, uh, German soldiers. But it was the first inch. That is, that is the... the, the that is, there is, yeah, I know, I know Article 5. Yeah. There is a great minute yeah, I know. in the treaty. And that is it important. It explains that. that, that, that who, uh, who, who decides? Who decides? Okay, I will read it. Deployment. Any question with respect to the application of word deployment, as used in the last sentence of paragraph 3, Article 5 will be decided by the government of the United Germany. But Here. it does not uh, any, uh, it, it requires interpretation of something that could be, uh, there is in, uh, you are not a lawyer, so there is, uh, there, in, yes, in law, questions, yes. uh, in law there is, there is a principle, in claris non fit interpretatio, if something is clear, there is no need for interpretation, if it says, Foreign armed forces and nuclear weapons of, uh, the, uh, and the, or their careers will not be stationed in that part of Germany or deployed there. So, uh, okay, if uh, we are not sure what is deployed, they cannot be stationed sufficient. So it is, it, it, it is clear there is, not, there is no need to, to make interpretation of something which is clear. This is for the rest of the, of the uh, what, uh, about uh, German uh, uh, army. Uh, because the, the, the paragraph three is a little bit longer. Uh, so that's it. And, uh, but but uh, the promises concerning the other Eastern, Eastern European countries is something different. It doesn't have anything with the, uh, it's not a part of a, a United German, a German, German state. And as, as, I, as I made a quotation of what uh, even Genscher said or, uh, uh, or what uh, uh, Baker agreed with, uh, with uh, 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 Gorbachev's word, uh, they uh, spoke about uh, 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 as guilt, uh, uh, ganz general, about uh, the whole, the the, the, the whole uh, uh, Eastern European territory. But did you did you admit? Sorry, no, did so, you admit so, so, that it so, was sorry, one inch? We have to word. we have to leave our interpreters. Sorry, I'm so sorry. We have to leave uh, because our interpreters worked for a long time. So we have to to let the other. Uh, member of this panel to answer to to the red so it's it's very interesting uh, debate a democratic one but we we, we are limited by uh, the work time of our interpreters and they are suffering right now so as you might have noticed i did not so, uh, make the quotation so, of the sentence from that uh, the Tanasi, time, uh, it's uh, uh, your turn point. now okay i didn't respond to oui, the just to respond to monsieur lafon donc uh, oui c'est l'idée il me semble qu'elle était Né en France, euh, parmi, comme je viens de dire, euh, euh, la gauche française, euh, et euh, c'était très courant dans nos discours euh, politiques à l'époque. Il y avait même un colloque qui était organisé par Bernard Kouchner, euh, qui était soutenu par euh, Jacques Chirac en 1987, à l'époque où il était le premier ministre. Et après, après c'était euh, repris par Mitterrand, qui... Euh, au début en France, dans ce contexte, il, cette idée était comprise euh, de, dans le sens de l'ingérence dans les cas des, des, des désastres naturels, euh, des réactions dans ce genre de cas. Par exemple, le tremblement de terre euh, en Arménie et d'autres situations de tel, de tel genre. Euh, après, dans la littérature anglophone, il y en a, et j'ai cité euh, en, en, en ce qui concerne les... Euh, euh, les universitaires et les, les, les chercheurs, notamment euh, Alan Buchanan et euh, sa, son livre euh, « euh, Légitimité, justice et euh, l'autodétermination euh, ». C'est vraiment une, un, un livre, de, livre de référence à cet égard. Euh, lorsque j'utilisais le mot euh, « nazisme », d'abord, je l'utilisais pour… Euh, ce, ce sont d'abord les propos de Poutine. 
ce sont de, de, les propos de Poutine euh, que j'ai euh, contrasté avec la, avec la réalité qu'on retrouve dans ces rapports du Conseil de l'Europe. Euh, et euh, comme, comme je viens de dire, ce qu'on trouve dans les rapports du Conseil de l'Europe, c'est qu'il y, y a vraiment des choses différentes. Euh, on, on, on voit aussi euh, les, euh, les, les références à la position des Tatars en Crimée et euh, leur euh, discrimination de la part des Russes, des autorités, à l'époque où, euh, voilà, avant le 2014, à l'époque où euh, euh, voilà, la minorité russe euh, avait la majorité dans l'Assemblée dans euh, régionale, euh, et était euh, le pouvoir local en place, euh, et, et ben, euh, il y a les éléments de la discrimination de la population tatar qu'on trouve de la part de, de la majorité russe euh, en cette région. Euh, mais il y a aussi des références au nazisme. Euh, bon, ce sont des, euh, si je me souviens bien, c'est le, le centre visental et c'est le forum des Juifs de l'Ukraine euh, qui euh, font référence dans le, euh, au nazisme dans le contexte de la rénomation, rénom, rénom, rénomation rénovation de certains lieux euh, en Ukraine. Et c'est dans ce contexte que euh, voilà, euh, j'ai fait la référence à ce terme dans, dans mon discours. Uh, 20 minutes. Two hours. Allez, quelques points, mais très concis. Slobodan Samardzic, je pense, a eu raison de, de finalement nous ramener à l'essentiel. C'est une guerre, pas entre l'Ukraine et la Russie, c'est une guerre entre l'OTAN et la Russie. Ce qui rend les propos de professeur Rakic judicieux dans le sens du, du choix du, du sujet, c'est important de, de parler de ça. Deuxième propos, alors Mario Bettati, droit de voir aucune différence juridique, ça n'existe pas. C'était symbolique, c'est plus qu'un droit, c'est un devoir, je ne vois pas très bien, j'ai lu tous les livres de Mario Bettati, enfin les deux, trois sur, le, sur, les, sur ces notions-là, mais en droit, ça n'a aucune, aucune conséquence juridique, sauf que c'était... Ça a servi d'idéologie et de prétexte à la politique de puissance, y compris au Kosovo. Et ça, on, on peut ouvrir le débat sur l'antipluralisme dans les relations internationales à partir des 90, bon, peu importe. C'est pour une autre conférence. Sur les nazis, je, je n'évacuerai pas aussi facilement l'argument russe sur le néonazisme en Ukraine. Et on pourrait parler avec un certain fondement, pas de l'ukrainisation de l'Ukraine, mais de la galicisation de l'Ukraine. Et le fait que Yushchenko, en 2010, avant de quitter le pouvoir, a rendu euh, M. Bandera héros national, ou la, la... Bon, c'est quand même assez parlant. Lui qui était un collaborateur, il y avait des divisions SS. Bon, ce n'est pas aussi simple que ça. Et je pense que c'est un argument de poids dans la rhétorique russe. Et finalement, le système international ne fonctionne pas. Non, je pense qu'on n'a jamais mis aussi efficacement à bas le système et les mécanismes de la sécurité collective. Sauf que là, il faut être tout à fait honnête. Cette, ce démantèlement, alors comme avait dit son excellence, pardonnez-moi de forcer un peu, mais il avait dit euh, mise en cause, est d'abord venu de l'Ouest, 99, 2003, 2011, Afghanistan, et pour des résultats catastrophiques pour certains pays qui n'existent pas. On a fait du malheur pour les Afghans, pour les Irakiens, pour les Libanais, enfin, ben, les Libyens. Donc, et c'est une action de l'Ouest avec une réaction à l'Est. Comment changer ça je pense que tant que de nouveaux équilibres géopolitiques ne se mettent pas en œuvre, et on est en plein dedans, la guerre en Ukraine est beaucoup plus que ce qui nous apparaît être. C'est vraiment, les enjeux sont un nouvel ordre, nouveau, nouvel ordre mondial, nouveaux équilibres géopolitiques, et seulement après, quand on aura les résultats de cette guerre, parce que ça va se terminer par une victoire, semi-victoire, défaite, semi-défaite, qu'on pourra éventuellement donner des propositions un peu plus concrètes pour la cette fois-ci, la rénovation du système et de l'ordre légal international. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour ces, ces propos euh, brefs, concis et percutants. Et je vais laisser la parole euh, à présent euh, à Tanassier qui va vous donner quelques petits mots pour, pour je suppose, vous, vous, vous remercier euh, d'avoir participé à cette, à cette conférence. Donc, Tanassier. Uh, yes, uh, Hugo, I would like to uh, thank you all for uh, uh, being with us uh, 
uh, these uh, past 48 hours and for the students uh, that have been with us since uh, Monday this, uh, this week. And I can tell you we also worked hard in those uh, uh, school days. Um, so I would like to thank you all for uh, being with us um, these two days, speaking of the conference now. Um, I think that um, this conference uh, with a variety of participants and topics and perspectives and especially the debates which we had um, showed its full uh, need and purpose um, not only in the context of uh, Serbian society and its uh, uh, um, uh, need to be informed about the, 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 the war in Ukraine, uh, its origins, uh, its parallels, uh, um, uh, economic uh, sanctions and other reactions, all the topics that we have uh, addressed uh, for these po uh, past um, um, two days. Uh, but I think that uh, this conference was also interesting to everyone else who followed us online and uh, we will uh, have uh, the, uh, the video of the conference uh, 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 presented and uh, uh, being able to, to be available on the website of the of the faculty. Um, so it will be also interesting and useful for everyone else to be informed about um, the the issues which we have addressed. Um, a, a very big thank, uh, uh, thanking in particular to the participants, to the speakers, uh, for their uh, for their big preparations uh, that they have made and for the uh, dedication which they have showed. Um, and uh, to announce that uh, we will publish the, the, the papers of this conference, uh, we have, a, uh, uh, um, we have the, the, the budget for that, and I think that uh, uh, the importance of the topics that we have addressed uh, allow us to believe that we can uh, maybe um, uh, have the, colloc uh, the, 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 the papers published uh, by some uh, renowned uh, a publisher uh, having in mind especially the moment uh, and uh, the broadness of the aspects that we that we have addressed um, so and also thank you all who have uh, participated in the discussions uh, they have really enriched uh, us all and i think that uh, uh, i hope at least that we are uh, um, uh, leaving this place uh, uh, with a bit more information on uh, on what is currently going on and, and, and last but not the least, I uh, think we should, uh, uh, with even a bigger applause, uh, thank the translators for their... Uh, for their laborious work uh, uh, these, two, these two days. Uh, especially thanking, in taking into account that uh, many of us have spoken very fast and uh, uh, that uh, the translation has been done through the Serbian language. So it's, uh, there has been a lot of work on, uh, on, the, on behalf of our ladies and we thank them all very much. Thank you and see you at some other, at some other conference. <laughs>